every time I, I walk off trail, I'm having an impact on the vegetation. Uh, but I'm doing it more consciously. You know, like last summer, I, I found myself early June in the high country and there's a lot of uh, wildflowers and stuff. And I found myself very cognizant of where I walked. You know, it's like, okay, there's a huge marshy meadow of flowers here. I'm going to I'm going to go around. I'm going to walk on the rocks. I'm going to try to avoid damaging things as best as I can. You know, it's really about mitigating our impact. You know, I don't think we can ever, honestly, ever, unless we commit suicide, <laughs> you know, we're not going to, or stop taking pictures. You know, we're not going to have zero impact. But I think there's a lot of things that we can do to um, collectively reduce our impact. I don't know who you are. But welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast. Sit back, relax, and listen about cameras, gear, settings, stories, and all things photography. Join Darren on Ireland's Best Photography Podcast. Let's go. And you're very welcome to episode 134 of the Irish Photography Podcast. My name is Darren, I'm your host this evening, and I'm joined by somebody who has inspired many people around the world. So without any further ado, welcome to the Irish Photography Podcast, Matt Payne. Matt, how are you getting on, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. Thanks for having me here. It's, uh, it's awesome. I, I wish I had the accent. It would make my life so much easier. <laughs> Yeah, you know what? Sometimes people tell me that I'm gifted to have the accent, but that's only when you hear it from outside of Ireland, because it's sure. quite normal when you listen to it here, you know? Yes. Um, how's your day been so far? It's nighttime for me, but it's afternoon for you. You kind of taught me there before we started, you were doing exercise, so you had a good day so far by the sounds of it. Yep, just uh, just did a little bit of ride it, riding on my uh, Peloton, and now I'm enjoying a uh, a beverage. Good man, good yeah. man. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Yep. And I suppose, you know, Matt, I alluded to it there at, on the intro. I mean, you have inspired a lot of people for many, many different reasons. And hopefully we'll get into those reasons as throughout the conversation anyway this evening. But to kind of give people a, an early insight into who you are, who is Matt Payne? All right. Well, <laughs> I'm just a, a regular dude who loves uh, nature and I love photography and I love being in nature, I'm inspired by it every time I go outside. Um, I am a 42-year-old, white, boring man. <laughs> I'm married uh, with one kid. He's uh, His name is Quinn, inspired by the Irish. My wife is actually 25% um, Irish. So Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. And um, he's thir my son is 13 years old. And... Uh, Gosh, what else about me? I've been a photographer since about 2010. Um, okay. Bought my first uh, real camera in 2011. Uh, uh, you know, okay. a, a Nikon D7000. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Yep. And then quickly transitioned into full frame. I got a D800, and that served me well for several years. And then in 2017, I switched over to Sony. Um, okay. Yep. Interesting move, actually, uh, to go from the D800 over to Sony, because people that would have the 800 would have naturally gone to the 850, I would have thought. But yeah, uh, what, what, what made you jump over to Sony, actually? Well, if you don't know this about me, I'm kind of a crazy man. I um, a lot of my photography, um, not so much in the last couple of years, but probably for the first eight years of my photography career, uh, my photography revolved around mountain climbing. So mm -hmm. I would take my camera and all my lenses with me and I would do these crazy mountain climbs here in Colorado, mm -hmm. um, you know, climb to the tops of 14,000 foot mountains in the dark to photograph sunrise from the nice. top. Nice. And got to tell you, the uh, Nikon D800 with the Holy Trinity, um, it, it weighs a little bit. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that was getting a little bit old. Uh, so I decided to uh, try to find a way to lighten my gear a little bit and you know, that at that time, the D800 was getting a little bit long in the tooth. And so decided to go for the Sony a7R2. And at that time, I was um, I picked up a bunch of prime lenses. So I had a, a Zeiss Loxia 21, the Sony, nice. the Sony 5518, and then the Sony 70 to 300. And I think all in, I think I was like six pounds total, which is wow. not bad at all. Um, I've since 
done a lot of rearranging with my gear and I've taken the weight back up a little bit, but uh, that was a nice way to finish out my goal of climbing the highest hundred mountains in Colorado with a, with a, with a much lighter kit. So yeah. Mm, mm. So that's Jeez, me. Yeah, that's me sure. in a nutshell. <laughs> and you know what? I mean, look, you've kind of touched on a number of things, which I kind of want to get into a bit more detail throughout the conversation anyway this evening, because, you know, you have a, from my side of things, looking at your work, you've got a phenomenal array of photographs. Mountains are heavily featured in your images as well, and we'll get into that also. But before we go into that, I suppose, you know, you mentioned 2010 when you got your into the photography and got your first camera properly in 2011. What made you start seeing things from a photography point of view? Because I know, like, and again, we'll get into it again during the conversation, but, you know, mountains have been part of your life a long, long time. So you've been around that scenery. But what pushed you to say, hang on a second, I think I need a camera here. What was the start of that journey? Yeah, well, I remember in 2010, well, actually, was it 2010 or 20, 2009? I don't know. The, the years start blending together when you get mm -hmm. old. Close like enough me. to 2010 anyway, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember <laughs> um, I climbed a really challenging set of mountains uh, here in the San Juans of Colorado. Uh, one is called Vestal Peak, uh, and the mm -hmm. other is called Arrow uh, Peak, and they're both high 13ers, so like 13,900 feet. Um, Vestal nice. Peak requires, um, it's about three pitches of um, class five roped climbing, um, and I remember, um, we did arrow peak and I photographed a uh, sunset from the top. Um, mm -hmm. and then we had to down climb it in the dark. And I remember just thinking how much better the photographs would have turned out if I knew what I was doing. Um, mm -hmm. cause up to that point I had taken that camera and at the time it was one of those old Sony, uh, DSC 828s. So it was like eight megapixels, wow. uh, but it had a really nice little fixed eight to 200 lens on it. Okay. Um, and I had realized that I'd kind of, I don't know, outgrown the use of that for what I was really wanting to do, um, which was to capitalize on these incredible uh, sights and views that I was able Jeez. to get with these from the tops of these mountains. And so I remember when we got down from Arrow, uh, we were eating dinner in the dark and I set up my camera and I didn't even have a tripod at that time, but I found some rocks and I stacked them up on my camera up on these rocks and I wanted to get mm -hmm. a photograph of the stars over um, Vestal Peak. And of course, yeah. my camera was not capable of doing that. And I was Up like, OK, yeah. this is it, man. I need to I need to learn how to do this properly. So um, after probably three or four years of of using that camera and getting the most out of it and getting some OK photos, I decided, man, I really need to to invest my time and money and learn how to do this the right way. and. So, of course, I got the D7000 and the 18 to 105 kit lens. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I quickly picked up the uh, Tokina 11 to 16 wide angle. Beautiful and lens. I checked out literally every uh, book in the library that I could find on photography, whether it was on, um, you know, the fundamentals of the exposure triangle or, you know, creativity or lighting or, you know, flash, like anything I could find. Um, one of the favorite books I found was, um, it was like a Lightroom creative editing book. Um, okay. And I can't remember the name of the author, but he's a pretty well-known dude. And I should know his name off the top of my head, but it's Tony escaping Northrup, me. Tony Northrup, no? What's that? Tony Northrup? No, it was, um, uh, it'll come to me. It'll come, yeah, yeah okay. But yeah, so you, you basically gorged on everything that you could possibly get yeah. to try and fill your brain and figure out how do I get this shot that you could see and that yeah. you could visualize, but didn't know how to put the two of them together as such like that, yeah? Exactly. And so yeah. from there, um, you know, I was, uh, back then I was probably climbing 30 to 40 mountains a summer. Um, and, wow. uh, you know, every weekend I would be out climbing mountains and using the camera. And it slowly evolved into this joke with my climbing friends, you know, that, you know, my, one of my, my best friends um, at the time, uh, his name was Sarah. Uh, his okay. name is now Silas, uh, okay. but he was a musician, um, and he would, he made up this song and it, it was like, I don't want to ruin your sunrise. Cause like I, I would make us get up at like three in the morning to climb to the tops of these crazy mountains <laughs> so that I would have a chance at photographing sunrise from the top. And yeah, that's, wow. uh, that's how it got started. And I just got more and more obsessed with the photography and, um, and yeah, it just became an obsession. 
it, it is quite addictive, you know, when you start to figure out how to use the buttons and the controls and that you actually can get the image that you visualized, not only with your eyes, but also in your head. And that's something I think that is hugely rewarding because everybody has that, I suppose, that, that fulcrum of movement in the scale when you kind of think you know what you're doing, you're just getting and then all of a sudden you nail it. And it's at that point you go, wow, okay. Now I want to even get better and I want to bring the scale to the other end of it as well. So I can absolutely see that because, you know, from the, the light that you'd experience at dawn, not many people see that as well on a mountain no. because you have to have balls of steel to be able to, number one, say that I'm going to do it, but have the ability to be able to get up there as well in darkness. So, you know, fair play to you, I suppose, to, number one, take the step to say, okay, I want to capture this beauty, but also, as you say, to capture it in a way that's actually going to be I suppose, representative of the scene. Because if you get a camera back back in 2008, 2009, 2010, okay, the cameras were good. But now the cameras that we have, there's no such thing as a bad camera these days because the ca totally. every single camera we have is phenomenal. So to be able to take that step to catch that image and then learn from it, I can absolutely see where the addiction will come from from, from that point of view. And is it landscape photography that you have... I don't want to say only photograph because I always pigeonhole myself and say I'm a landscape photographer. That's it. I don't do anything else. But have you tried other styles of photography then uh, since you picked up the camera? Yeah. So interestingly enough, I was um, when I first got my uh, D7000, uh, I really experimented in pretty much everything. I mean, I don't know. I'm not like this anymore. But back then I would literally take my camera everywhere. Like I would take it to work. I would take it to the grocery <laughs> store. I would take it any trip I would do with my family. Like it was kind of absurd right like every time mm -hmm. you know there's matt taking a picture of something um <laughs> matt, and the so camera guy, yeah yeah and so you know i would take pictures of like people at work and uh people on the street or you know parties or you know events at bars and i just whatever i could take pictures of and it really was just about mastering um the camera and about learning light and composition and you know shutter speed and all that kind of stuff and I even did a um, 365 project where literally I was trying to just, I would do like self portraits with flash and like juggling and with a white background behind me, or mm -hmm. I would do like light painting with flashlights in the dark or, um, wow. you know, and then, you know, of course I bought the D800 with the, the Holy Trinity and I was, I was pretty poor back then. <laughs> like I did not make a lot of money. I was working for a nonprofit. I still work for a nonprofit, but I was like really low on the totem pole making no money. And of course, mm -hmm. I had to pay off all this equipment that I just bought. So I took a studio lighting class and um, was uh, spent a lot of time on strobus.com and learned okay. off-camera flash and put a put like a $50 ad in one of the local high school newspapers um, and basically mm -hmm. took a ton of high school uh, senior portraits. Oh, brilliant. And yeah, so I learned how to do portraits and, you know, off-camera flash and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I think that's really great to learn, you know, the dynamics of light and light fall off and, you know, mm -hmm. editing and, you know, depth of field and all those kinds of things. And I think I got pretty good at it. And of course, after that, people are asking you to shoot weddings. And so I've basically done it all. But of course, you know, nature and landscape is the thing I come back to time and time again. Um, it's just so much more rewarding. It doesn't feel like work. It um um, it's where I feel at home. It's, mm -hmm. you know, what I get mm -hmm. most excited about. So, yeah. That's interesting because, you know, when you say about going to the library and getting every single book you could possibly get, I mean, you actually then put it all into practice as well, which is phenomenal to do because like, let me ask you a question, I suppose, as a side note, how often now do you do those things with the camera? Like, do, do, do you still bring the camera? If you're going out on a, not just a, on a, a hike or anything like that, but you're just going on a walk somewhere or you're with people, do you bring the camera with you then as well still? Um, it depends. I would say more often than not, more often than not I don't. Um, okay. Because, uh, I don't know, I just feel like a lot of times I like to separate my intention um, a little bit. Like, this, is, uh, this time right here is for being with my family and my friends. This time over here is really about um, personal expression and and exploring nature and and it's really hard to do both of those things really well at the same time I find um, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I try to I try to segregate those things as best I can just mo more f so for um, <laughs> to, to not you know piss off my wife um, or <laughs> That's my friends important. yeah or you know not not to annoy my friends you know if we're on a hike together I don't want to. 
I don't want them to be waiting around and, you know, cause you know how it is. It's like you get to a spot and you see a scene and you're like, Oh, this is going to look good in about 45 minutes. Trust me. And then yeah. of course, 45 minutes or later, later, you're like, make 15 more minutes. It's going to look good. You know, and it just becomes <laughs> this thing where like no one can trust you anymore. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, I get that 100% because, you know, we, as photographers you don't really have that much grasp of time on your wrist you have time of light and you're looking for the light and you're waiting for the light and you're hoping that this is going to hit for where you think it's going to hit but you know what i mean it's it's nature it's not predictable and then you might go hang on i missed it hang on oh look i see another gap over here and we'll wait another half an hour and your friends will get pissed off with that yeah it's like are you like serious that, yeah. man yeah. <laughs> come on my friend silas i was telling you about we do a lot of backpacking together to climb mountains Mm -hmm. And, you know, I do a lot of night photography on these trips or like, you know, blue hour stuff. And I'm like, hey, do you want to go with me? And he's like, no, I'm just going to hang out in the tent. You have fun. You know, it's because uh, he knows <laughs> he, it's it's he knows it, it can be ridiculous. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I suppose, you know, we've touched it there a couple of times, but you describe yourself as a mountaineer before a photographer. So like this passion, I believe, came from an early age. And I suppose it's still with you today. Tell me a bit about the background and how the mountains have become all consuming as part of you. Yeah, I mean, as far as back as I can remember, uh, being in the Colorado mountains has just been a part of my life. Um, I climbed. Well, so before we start there, let me just put, preface it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. because a mountain to me is a different than a a mountain to you in Ireland and it's also different than someone who lives in Nepal right so mm -hmm. like there's mm -hmm. varying degrees of what we call mountains and even mm -hmm. here in Colorado um, a vast majority of our high mountains are more like just big round hills um, okay. but there's a lot of them that have you know steep drop-offs and some technical climbing involved so at an early age my parents uh, would just take me on these easy hikes up mountains but they were high they were high up you would have to climb like two three four thousand feet up to get to the okay. top and i think i climbed my first one when i was four and then i climbed my wow. first um here in colorado they're called the 14ers um mm -hmm. there's 53 over fourteen thousand feet is it yeah there's okay, 53 yeah. of them um depending wow. on who you ask but there's 53 that are considered ranked which means okay. that they have a prominence of over 300 feet which is the the distance and elevation between it and its next highest neighbor Okay. Anyway, okay. that's what prominence is. And so essentially, before I was even in high school, I probably climbed 15, 20 mountains. Um, wow. So I was, you know, that my parents didn't have a lot of money, but we did a lot of camping trips together. So we would go up into the mountains uh, for the weekend, uh, bring our tent, bring our sleeping bag, bring our sleeping pads, um, you know, camp, cook around a campfire, and then nice. in the morning, climb up to the top of a nearby mountain. And so that's what I grew up doing. And, and you know, that, that gave me a deep appreciation for, for, for nature and the natural world and what you find in nature. You know, forests and mountains and rocks and geology and f plants and mushrooms and all those things are things mm -hmm. that I've always had a deep relationship with um, just because that's, that's what I grew up, you know, being around. Um, I, I mm -hmm. suppose... Some people in the city, it's more like convenience stores and dance halls and uh, I don't know, like uh, skate parks and stuff. But yeah. for me, it was always Walmart car parks. Yeah. 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 For me, it was always going up into the mountains and camping and campfires and hiking. So. Wow. Well, to put it into perspective for you, as you say, you know, a mountain for Ireland is different to a mountain in Colorado, a different to a mountain in Nepal, because our highest mountain is 1000 meters, which is three, just over 3000 feet. So. And that's Caron Tool, and that's the highest mountain in Ireland. But that itself is still a trek because it's not, you know, a, a, an easy gradient. There's, there's actually some steep areas well to climb there. It's not for the faint-hearted, let's just say, but it is something which is achievable for many, many people. And I think, sure. you know, the the draw of that is something which itself can be quite addictive. So, from your point of view, if I was to ask you, in to, to sum it up in a nutshell, what would be the most addictive thing to you that the mountains have you? What is it? Oh man, it's the whole experience. It's uh, it's the the physical challenge. You know the dopamine hit that you get when you're when you get to the top and you've accomplished something that you're proud of. Um, it's uh, you know that 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 physical um, overcoming a physical challenge, overcoming a mental challenge. Um, it's you know 
there's almost a spiritual aspect of it in terms of your connection Mm -hmm. with place. Um, I remember when I got really back into it back in 2008, I did a kind of a group climb with people from a 14ers forum, like online. And so these people I didn't know. And I remember when we got to the top, I was like, okay, boom, there's that mountain, that mountain. I could name every mountain we see, all of them. I could just name them off. And they were like, what is wrong with this guy? And it's just because I, I had such a deep connection to those places. And, you know, when we do these trips growing up, I would study the maps. You know, I would, we'd get to the tops of the mountain and I'd be sitting around looking at the map. And I, and I would say to my dad, I'm like, okay, is that, that's that mountain. That's this mountain. That's, and he'd be like, yep, yep, yep. So like, right. I don't know the, just the, the, the whole process is just, um, incredibly rewarding, incredibly, um, it's just a deep part of who I am. And mm-hmm. um, that would be the worst part if uh, if I had lost my ability to experience that. For sure. And, you know, question that comes to me to mind from that is mountaineering. Is it more physical or is it more mental? Yeah, I think it depends on the uh, the mountain. Right. So um, I, I actually enjoy trying to uh, rate each climb based on those two variables you know, mm-hmm. and also time and effort. Uh, there are certain mountains that have all of it. You know, you've got the technical, you've got the physical, you've got the time commitment. The f- you know, it's, it takes forever. Um, mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. you have to overcome some mental challenges in terms of, okay, if I slip right here, I will probably die. Um, you know, mm-hmm. that stuff. But I think for the most part, a lot of it is, um, it's probably just physical, you know, the endurance of, staying after it because you know here in Colorado most times of the year you have to you know there's a speed element to it as well you know there's lightning that you have to be Mm -hmm. concerned about most days um so you know there's a you know there's it's a it's a constant game of evaluating your environment and um I remember one mountain I climbed which is a relatively difficult one called Capitol Peak um it's sort of famous because it has this knife edge that people like to do GoPro videos from Um, okay but I did it with this guy who runs marathons regularly. And I've never ran a marathon because that sounds really hard to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but he yeah. he said that climbing that mountain was way harder than a, than a marathon just because of the, the constant mental effort it took to focus on, you know, where you're putting your feet and where you step and, you know, what's happening next, evaluating the weather. So mm-hmm. I think it's just a it's like a really interesting mixture of all those things. Yeah, because, you know, when you mentioned it there, I, I was thinking very similar to that, actually, from a marathon point of view. I haven't run a marathon either, but I know from people that would r- run marathons and they go, you've hit the wall. Yes. But you have to get past the wall because your body can get past the wall, but your mind is the one that says, I can't go any further. But that's why I'm thinking, you know, and I suppose it brings me on to the next thing I wanted to ask you is that you alluded at the very beginning there is that, you know, you successfully climbed 100 peaks. And that must be an incredible accomplishment, number one, to be able to say, I want to do that, but also to actually go and do that and to successfully complete that. So tell us a bit more about that, because that is something which is phenomenal to achieve. So what was the motivation, number one, uh, to do that? Yeah, well, I mean, it started with my upbringing. So um, the reason why my dad was bringing me on all of these hikes and climbs is because his goal was to climb the highest hundred mountains in Colorado. They're called the Centennials. The hundredth highest is still like thirteen eight something. So it's they're all basically fourteen thousand feet up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, so so you know I got super interested in it through my dad. Um, he used to have a um, this is you know back in the day before the internet and the computers and stuff. But mm-hmm. he had this big old cork board in our basement, um, and it had um, it had a USGS which is. I don't know what the equivalent is, but it's a, basically a big giant topo map of, okay. the, of the state of Colorado on it. And then um, it was actually a reference map that had like the outlines of all the different top, 7.5 minute topo map quadrangles. And okay, then yeah. in those, he had placed um, pins, uh, a blue pin for, the, for a 13er that was in the highest 100 and a red pin for a 14er. And then he would take white out um, when he climbed it so he could like visually see his progress. And so of course, like I could just see that and it was like this really big deal. And so I just got really immersed into it, um, through him. And so, um, after my son was born in 2007, 
I decided I really wanted to get back into that. And also I was getting fat. <laughs> okay. I was Good playing motivation, a, yeah. I was yeah. playing a lot of video games and World of Warcraft and drinking a lot of Pepsi and I was just getting chunky and I was like, man, I need to take better care of myself. So I started exercising and working out again and and then yeah, I was like, okay, I'm gonna screw it. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna climb the highest hundred mountains in Colorado. And up to that point, um I hadn't done any of the hard ones yet, so I knew it would be a huge undertaking because you know you can probably climb I don't know 60 of those and not have to learn anything about um you know technical climbing you know mm -hmm. it's just mm -hmm. walking up hills mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but there's about 30 to 40 of them where you you know you need you need to have a little bit of knowledge about climbing safely and stuff like that so yeah, I just, um, I dove head first into it and made a plan. I created a whole, whole calendar, um, wow. you know, just obsessively researched every mountain, you know, what were the safe routes up and how would you do them and what's the best time to go and mm -hmm. how do you get there? And yeah, it just became a, I don't know. An obsession? Yeah, basically. <laughs> when I, yeah. I don't know, like when I do some, when I decide I'm really going to do something, I do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And tell me, how long did it take you to do the hundred from start to finish? Well, technically, <laughs> technically, it took me uh, what thirty-eight years, but yeah. but really, I think the bulk of it was in um, like a eight-year period. Wow! And obviously, there was times when you wanted to go too, but you couldn't go out then because the weather wouldn't allow you to go out if you had an opportunity to go as well. So, it's sure, kind of kicking them down the line as well, I imagine, yeah. Sure. There's bad weather there, that happened quite a bit. Um, there's, you know, other stuff that comes up, you know, you have, you know, other commitments with your job or with family. Um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I famously completely missed my first, my wife's first, first mother's day because I was obsessed about this, uh, particular mountain. I'll never live that okay. one down. No. <laughs> um, but you know, I learned that lesson. Um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, you only make that mistake once. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but that just tells you like how obsessed I was about it. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and and when you finish that, it's on um, Thunder Pyramid, I think is the name. But I remember watching the YouTube video at the time. For some reason, it popped up in my feed. And I looked and went, what's this? And I saw it and I could see something. I was like, what's this about? And now I know what it's about. And like, let me ask you a question in relation to it. Because like, there's a number of years, as you say, building up to get to that point. And finishing it on that peak, how did it feel back then? And how does it feel now? Yeah, it was interesting. A great question. Um, you know, at the time, it was a, a whole flood of emotions, um, excitement, elation, um, you know, a sense of accomplishment, but also like a sense of um, loss almost, you know, like you've been working towards this huge goal mm -hmm, for so mm -hmm so long and now that you've finished it it you kind of get left with this sense of like okay okay now like you almost feel a little bit empty like yeah oh no what do i do now yeah. um so that was an interesting experience and it was very emotional for me and you know make it to make matters worse my parents had written me a handwritten letter and given it to my climbing partner um to give to me at the top for me to read and okay, then, you know, yeah. it was all about like how proud they were of me. And of course, I'm just up there crying. And it of was, course. yeah, it was just a flood of joy, sadness, happiness, excitement. I mean, it was everything, all of it. And then now I look back on it and it was like, you know, that was really cool. That was, that was pretty neat so that I did that. And, you know, it proves that I can, if I put my mind towards something, I can pull it off and do it well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's definitely a lot less, um, emotional i guess i would say yeah and you know something that again that comes to mind from that is after you did it and after you had the sense of accomplishment and after the adrenaline and everything else was what pushed you on for the final part to reach there because it's in your sights i can see it i'm going to push on you have somebody with you come on come on we can do it and you do it you still have to come back down so how were your knees going back down with the adrenaline void were your knees shaking going back down afterwards yeah, I mean, they weren't shaking on that particular mountain, although I was very uh, cognizant of the of the risks. Um, that particular mountain um, has claimed several people's lives. Okay. Um, and, oh, and it was almost always on the down climb um, mm -hmm. because it's extremely loose, steep rock with, you know, if you 
knock a rock in the wrong way, the whole thing will come down on top of you yeah. um, or yeah. sweep you down. Um, it's very dangerous mountain. So, you know, after we had celebrated and all that at the top, it was, you know, it was back to game time, game face, take it seriously. Let's take our time. Let's, let's get down this thing safely. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it can be very sobering, you know, you, you, and, 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 and exhilarating knowing if I make a mistake here, that can be the end. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, we're very careful. Um, we, we evaluate our risks. We evaluate our, our steps. We have a lot of experience um, about knowing where to step and where not to step and how to, you know, traverse down the safest way. But, you know, you can't ever fully eliminate uh, the risks that are inherent Risk. in being yeah. on the mountain. Yeah, for sure. Well, look, an absolutely phenomenal achievement. And, you know, from my side of things, congratulations on doing it. And oh, I think, you. you know, again, you know, to get to these locations and to be able to get around to these locations, I was often thinking, I was like, OK, how does he get there? What has he got? And then I saw you at a video and I looked and I went, oh, my God, he has a truck, which is like a truck of dream. I could have a podcast completely about your truck, I think, because you seem to have thought it very well through. Um, and it allows you to be able to get to places and just as you said earlier on, be in location ready to hike in the middle of the night. Instead of having to leave at 11 p.m. at night to drive somewhere, you can go there, park up. Tell us a bit more about your truck. I know it's going to be hard for trying to describe it over a podcast, but That's all try. Right. It's, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal truck. So, yeah, I'm interested to learn more. Well, yeah, it was, um, it was super inspired by my friend uh, Shane McDermott. He had a nissan xterra that he put a ton of thought and money into um and it's you know it's essentially a pretty advanced overlanding setup um so basically what i've done is i have a 2011 toyota 4runner and it's got the um you know like all the crazy off-road package so it's got a rear differential um it's got a four inch lift and kdss suspension and um, a front bumper with a winch and a steel rear bumper, blah, 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 all that fun stuff. Uh, light mm-hmm. bars, all that, all that fun off-roading stuff. All the toys, yeah. All the, all the toys, all the toys like, to get you to where you need to go. But um, the, what, I, what I quickly realized on um, these photography trips that I like to do is you spend a lot of time um, setting up your campsite, tearing down your campsite, Mm-hmm. Um, and that's time you can be spending shooting. That can be time you can spend sleeping. That can be time you can spend enjoying a beer with your friends. So, mm-hmm. so essentially what I've done is I've taken um, the entire uh, rear sec- cargo section of my Toyota 4Runner, and I've installed um, three uh, cargo boxes um, from a company called ARB. And they're about four feet um, depth deep. Um, Mm -hmm. and mm, three feet wide and I have two stacked on top of each other on the left and a small one on the right. The two on the left basically contain the entirety of everything I would need for, um, cooking and cleaning, uh, for my meals. So it's got all my pots and pans and plates and bowls and dishes and silverware and all that fun stuff, Mm -hmm. tools too. And then the right hand side, the one on the, the bottom, you pull it out and it's got like. You know, it's got a saw, it's got a hatchet, it's got um, all of my off-roading, like, um, toe straps and, you know, stuff like that. Um, okay. And then on top of that particular box, I have installed a um, AT Overlander combo slider, um, which has a partner steel uh, stove that pulls out. And nice. it has a, um, a AR, or, I'm sorry, a National Luna refrigerator um, slide that pulls out so the refrigerator slides out on its own slide and then the stove underneath it slides out on its own st- uh, slide and then I have a propane tank that connects to all that so basically within I don't know 45 seconds I can have my entire kitchen set up and ready to cook food um, without having to have a set up a table or or a, you know a camp stove or anything like that and then on top of the uh, cargo boxes on the left, I have a 12-gallon water reservoir set up on top of that. So I have all my water there. It's up high, so it's you know it comes out through gravity. Um, and then on the top of my 4Runner, I have a, a Gobi rack. 
and a, um, a roof nest, uh, Falcon XL rooftop tent, which sets That's up sweet. That, that is sweet. That thing. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. sets Tell up us a bit in, more about that. That's phenomenal. Oh, it's awesome, man. It sets up in like, I don't know, 45 seconds to get it completely set up. And it takes about mm, one to two minutes to tear it down. Um, which is kind of the advantage of it. You know, I can basically have my entire campsite up and down, ready to go in five minutes or less. So it's all about, you know, you, you, you find a really cool campsite, you're ready to go, you're ready to cook, you're ready to sleep, you're ready to cook a campfire, whatever. And then in the morning you get up, there's minimal teardown and you're, you can drive, you know, 45 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever to get to a sunrise location and you're ready to shoot. So um, it's, it's kind of like a camper van, but like with off-road capability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go go anywhere and allow you to get set up, as you say, in record fast time. And it's, with, with that in mind, then, has it changed you in regards to the areas that you can now go to by having that flexibility, not having to have, you say, all that time wasted with the setup and the teardown afterwards? I mean, has it allowed you to get to locations much easier since you've created that full setup? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest advantage that I've found with it is um, the ability to just get up and go um, on on any given notice. So, like, if my friend calls me and says, hey, man, I know it's last minute, but we're going to go shoot this scene, um, and it's, like, an hour from your house, and we have a cool campsite, let's go. I don't have to be like, oh, man, I have to, like, take four hours to put everything in my truck. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, so, so it's, it's made it to where literally like within an hour or two, I can be on the road and go. Um, and then obviously it just makes it so much easier to, to, to be able to, to go to different places really quickly when you're out and about, um, um, on photo trips. And, you know, a lot of what we like to do is, um, for example, is, a like go for like 10 to 14 days in the, in the fall here in autumn. And, you know, we'll go to one area, we might sit up camp for one or two days, uh, maybe set up a real nice campsite and then drive up the road for sunrise for 30 minutes and then come back and reset up again. And it just saves so much time and hassle, you know. Um, the other thing I did that's really fun is uh, that was inspired my, by my friend Shane is um, I have a second battery under my hood and I have a... Um, I have solar panels, so basically the 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 second battery powers my refrigerator, so I never have to purchase ice. I never mm. never have to worry about my food spoiling um, or my battery dying. I mean, I live in Colorado, so there's most of the time there's sun, um, mm. but I've also picked up a couple of external. They call them solar, I don't know, power generators, but it's basically like a big battery that can be powered by solar power. So I have a couple of those as well. And that's nice. really great for charging, you know, drone batteries or your camera batteries or and you don't even have to have your car running, you know, or you have access to electricity. You know, you basically have unlimited power as long as the sun is out. So nice. It's, it's pretty fun. Nice. Yeah. And again, like we say, you know, it allows you to be able to get to those locations and not have to worry about many, many other things that would naturally come from getting to locations like that. So, yeah, when I first saw that, I went, oh, yeah, look at it. I mean. <laughs> It looked to me as if you thought of everything because you even whipped out one of the back seats as well and created a flat deck area so you can put other stuff within that as well, like camera gear, bags and such of that, easy access, no messing around. And I think the other advantage, I think, is that, you know, you now know that there's a place for everything and everything in its place. So when you're going oh off God. out somewhere, you know, it's bang on. Yeah, it's funny, right? Um well, I remember the first uh, trip I did in that in that truck before I put all those other things into it. You know, you spend like f an hour a day trying to remember where you put something, and and now it's mm -hmm. like everything has its very specific place, and it goes in this in this spot, and you know where everything is and where it goes, and it's you know there's no anxiety around. Um, I don't know about you, but traveling and doing trips like that, there's a lot of anxiety around you know your yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going it, to forget something important. Yeah, <laughs> I'm exactly. Lose something important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, did I remember to bring this? And it's like, oh, it's it's literally part of my car, so I don't have to worry about yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's there. It's there. And you and, and you can go to those locations with the peace of mind that you don't have to second guess yourself in the back of your head going, 
shit. Like people think, did I leave the, the, the gas on at home or did I leave the heating on or did right. I lock the door? Or like everything is within your truck and now you're heading off to the next location knowing that you're not going to be missing anything. And you also find it, I find with my, my own camera bag that I know what everything is in my camera bag. So right. if, I, if I see a gap, I know I've forgotten something. Right. So then I, I won't ever have that gap. And also when we're out in the field, if we take things out of our camera bag, it's very easy to put something down and then you might walk away and leave it. Whereas if you know where it goes, it goes back into that spot, then you don't lose it and off you are to the, the next location. It's a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal yeah. truck. Fair play to you for what you've done that, yeah. Yeah, I even, um, I even installed like a cargo net for the ceiling so I can put all of my pillows and blankets nice. and a sleeping bag and coats up there. So um, I remember a trip when I was like eight years old or something like that, maybe six or seven. I, I was really young. It was one of my family camping trips that we would do every weekend. And I remember we left our house really late, like, I don't know, 6 p.m. And we had like a four hour drive, okay. something like that, three, four hour drive. Um, it was further away than we normally would go. And I remember we would, we got all the way to this place and we were meeting a friend there. And we got there and we were get, trying to get set up for camping. We had left all of our sleeping bags at home. Wow. So we literally drove all the way back home to get our sleeping bags. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so like that that's will never real, happen to me. <laughs> that's a real road trip. Yeah. I mean, like it's a road trip, nothing but a road trip and heading to a location. And then all of a sudden you have to turn around and go back home again. Oh, yeah, it's so, awful. Yeah. A good yeah, lesson. Yeah. And, you know, speaking of locations, the question I want to ask you, I suppose, is why do you love the Columbia R River Gorge so much? What is it about it? Oh, you know, I um I have to admit I haven't photographed the gorge as much as I would like to. Um, I actually only lived in um, Oregon for two years, um, okay. but uh, when I did live there, I was lucky enough to you know have some friends that um, were very familiar with a lot of places there, and could show me around and show me what it was like. And I remember um, I I did like a probably five or six day trip with my friend Kane Engelbert and Mark, Mark Hespin Heidi. And uh, that was my, my first real taste of the gorge. And man, if you've never experienced, um, like a rainforest with waterfalls and huge ferns and, 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 you know, like flowers underneath the canopy and mm. that smell of the humid forest, mm -hmm. um, it's pretty magical. And, uh, I don't know. I was, I had spent most of my time in Colorado where it's mostly dry and there's mountains and, you know, there's no rainforest. There's no huge mm -hmm. waterfalls really. So uh, for me, it's all about chasing, chasing those waterfalls and, and, and trying to find interesting ways to shoot them. I haven't actually been able to do that since, gosh, man, it's been, I think the last time I photographed a waterfall in the gorge was 2015. Wow. Yeah. Wow, too long. But um, here this coming May, my friend Kane and I are going to go back. So we're going to... Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we're, we're doing a huge trip. We're going to go to the Alvord Desert in uh, Western Oregon, mm, or nice. Eastern Oregon. Sorry, my directions were mixed up. And then we're going to do <laughs> a bunch Oregon. of... Oregon. You were close, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to do a bunch of waterfalls in Central Oregon, and then we're going to head down into the, uh, the, red, uh, the Redwoods in California. So, nice. um, and I've never nice. photographed the redwoods, and I'm really excited to uh, to experience that. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, it's yeah. one of those things, man. You 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 see these amazing scenes in nature, and it just bites you, and you you get hooked, and you want to see mm. what you you want to push it further and further, and you want to see more and more of it. And um, when you're in the 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 rainforests and the and the waterfalls in Oregon and Washington, it's um, it's a pretty magical experience yeah it's, it's, it's like something you've never experienced before but a place you never want to leave either i imagine because it's it captivates you because it's like something i often find that if i find a location that i really really fall in love with time just goes away just forget about time that doesn't even come into the factor of it but you're all you're thinking about it when you're there but you're also thinking about it after you've left yeah and that's when you know some place has you and that you want to go back and you want yeah. to experience it more it's, it's, got, you by its, it's yeah, got you by absolutely. its hooks yeah, exactly. And it what, won't let you go. What are the what are the places that you like uh, out there in Ireland? Well, 
Ireland is quite interesting because for a tiny island, we have a huge plethora of things to be able to take a photograph of. What we don't have is a desert, and what we don't have is rainforests. No, sure. You could argue that every forest in Ireland is a rainforest because it rains 300 days of the year. So, I mean, there is an argument in relation to that. But for me, my fascination is water and anything with water. I'm I'm totally in love with the sea. I mean, we're in Ireland at the moment. We are in lockdown from COVID and I can go five kilometers. And that's been the same way since December 31st. So as a seascape photographer, my heart is pining every single day. I mean, <laughs> that. You know, I really, I, for me, it's a release because it's it's my happy place. I love the feeling. I love the motion. I love the whole fact of the photography point of view with water is that no image is ever going to be the same because right. water will always give you something unique. So anything with water for me, waterfalls, I love it. Um, because again, you know, when you first get a camera, you come along, you take your photograph, bang, oh, I have my waterfall. But as you start to learn things, you know that you can control the flow of the water. You can right. use filters. And you go, okay, I can start creating something ethereal here. But then when you start learning about composition, and that's what I fascinates me, is because you can take a scene that somebody else would have visited 20, 30 times before, and they won't recognize it as being the same waterfall because you were down close to the water, you were whatever, in, in, inside a bush creating a viewpoint that somebody would never actually see. So yeah. from my point of view, that's what fascinates me. And like, you know, that whole area of the Columbia River Gorge, as you describe it, is like, yeah, that's right up my street. If I, if I went in that, I'd never get out of it. Oh, I mean, and there's um, there's so much stuff in there that um, very rarely gets photographed that is uh, it's not that far off the beaten path. Um, and it's, uh, it's kind of endless out there. I mean, to be honest, mm. um, you know, I feel like Mark Adamus kind of put that area on the map in terms of some of those more creative compositions. And, you know, as, as much as people, including myself, uh, talk negatively about um, the processing uh, style that he's kind of proliferated, you, you have to mm -hmm. admire um, the amount of uh, work and effort and ingenuity that he and others have put in into discovering places and and showing the world what could be possible um, uh, with with some of those scenes. You know, I remember the first time I went to Eloa Falls. I'm not gonna lie. I literally was like, I need that shot where you have the <laughs> the little the little pool of water in the rock with Eloa Falls reflected in it with a little leaf over here. And then you, mm -hmm. and you've got the, the rainforest canopy kind of coming in over it. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's something to be said for, for scenes like that, that, um, and then of course, like you go 20 feet down river from there and there's like probably 20, 30 compositions that work really good too. So, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's so much fun. <laughs> yeah. And I don't it know is, about you, know, you but uh, my biggest mistake with waterfalls was uh, I was always obsessed. Like, I'm going to put a 10-stop ND filter on there, and oh. I'm just going to shoot this for 30 seconds and smooth all the water out. And now I'm like, okay, I need, like, like a 3-stop and, like, a CPL, and I, I want to have, like, total control over, like, the, you know, I want some texture in there. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm excited to go back and shoot some of those scenes uh, that I've totally screwed up back in 2015 <laughs> for sure and you know you, you hit on a couple of things actually there i suppose which is interesting matt i think when everybody starts out and they start editing photos they they, they, they see lightroom or photoshop and then on, on the, the, the the sliders it goes to 10 they're never designed to go to 10 right but most oh, yeah. people go oh, gee, it goes to 10 oh yeah we give it the most saturation we can possibly give it look at that wow it's amazing but you look back in it four or five years later and you go jesus christ what was i thinking because totally that is something Everybody has to go through that. And and the other thing you say about the, the 10 stop, you know, um, I have a 10 stop and I rarely use it. Um, and what I always generally do for water, and it's my go to exposure time is half a second. And yeah. I do that at the sea and I do that at waterfalls because you will keep the texture, but you'll also get that bit of movement. So it actually sure. looks like it's alive. And that's something that it only comes with practice. You know, I mean, I might go out tomorrow. If I could go somewhere tomorrow, but I might go tomorrow and I might go, oh, hang on, this actually scene could be nice to go for an ultra long exposure. And I'll do it then because at least I have the tools to do it. But 
I wouldn't throw on a tent stop every single time I go near water for sure. But again, there are people that do that and it works perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Like, you know, I mean, one thing I like to do um, that I've done for a long time, and it might surprise people based on my reputation as being a more of a purist now, but I, mm-hmm. I love, um, you know, taking uh, multiple variable exposures of water at different exposure speeds, you know, um, maybe a 30 second exposure, maybe a five second, maybe a one second, maybe a quarter of a second and then you can creatively blend in some of the Mm. textures in the water and and really come up with some really unique creative ways of showcasing the smoothness in some places and the texture in others and i i mean i don't think there's anything wrong with that in terms of you know like i think that's fun it's uh absolutely yeah absolutely totally i mean look at the end of the day, photography should be about you, not the audience. And if like, uh, I remember very early on in the podcast, we had a photographer on Michael O'Sullivan here, and he'd said something which stuck with me for uh, since then is don't shoot for the gallery. Yes. Shoot for yourself. And if, if you enjoy the image and you like the image, and that's all that matters. But I think what happens in this day and age is that people are going out to try and get that shot and right. they want to replicate that shot and they want to get that shot for the gram or whatever it may have been. But that isn't actually true to yourself because you're trying to do something for an audience, but you may not even enjoy trying to take those images, but you think the audience is going to like it. But ultimately, it's not what it's about developing your own style. You know, you, you have to develop your own style, really, don't you? Yeah, well, I'm, that's a process, right? So, um, mm. you know, when I first started out, and I've kind of come full circle, but when I first started out, it was really just about documenting um, what I found in nature to be beautiful. It had nothing to do with art, artistry or style. It was really just like, oh, that's beautiful. I want to remember that. Um, and then as I got more and more into photography, and I, you know, you need something as a reference, right? Um, I mean, you don't have to, but I, th- I think that's why this happens. So many mm-hmm. of us look online. We say, oh, that's a cool picture. I want to take that picture too. And honestly, that's a really fantastic way to learn, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's something that... You know, I don't think everyone has to go through that, but it's totally, re- totally realistic to know that most of us kind of have to go through that, you know, mm-hmm. like copying mm-hmm. other people and learning and understanding, okay, why does this work? Okay, it's because of this and that, and this is arranged this way, and, you know, the light's hitting it that way. So it's, it's a really great way to learn the craft of uh, photography and re- learn the artistry side of it. But I think at some point, to your, to your point, if you want to differentiate yourself in any way and you want to have a personal connection to the work that you're creating, you have to kind of start uh, straying away from that path a bit. And, and, and I, I'm super lucky that I kind of came to that on my own um, you know, because I was super hardcore into copying for a long time. You know, mm-hmm. like I would be like, oh, I want to get that shot, too. And where's that shot? And how do I get there? And what? And that's the way I operated. I mean, I was telling you about how I climb mountains, like the same logistics applied for me for photography. I was like, OK, how do I get there? Where do I need to go? Mm-hmm. Where do I put my tripod? Mm-hmm. What lens do mm-hmm. I put on? You know, what I mean, like that was very <laughs> much the my style of photography. But after a while, that became very unrewarding for me. Um, mm-hmm. a, f- a couple reasons. One. The conditions are never going to be what you expect in terms of what somebody else got, right? It's like, Agreed. oh, yeah. like I remember the first time that happened to me, like really hardcore is uh, I was trying to get a, the exact same shot that uh, Alex Noriega has. <laughs> okay. From, uh, he's a good friend of mine now, but at the time I didn't know him. I just knew of his amazing photography. And it was this shot from Tom, Dick and Harry Mountain uh, looking at Mountain Hood. And it was when I first okay. had moved to Portland, Oregon. And it's got these really awesome jagged rocks in the foreground. And there's a lake down there called Mirror Lake that you can see. And it's just compositionally, it's just, it's just so, uh, it's, bi- it's bitching, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. And of course, his scene had these crazy, insane sunset clouds. And I remember I went back to that spot six times to try to get the wow. same conditions. And of course, it never happened. Um, and I was so, I just got sick of it. Uh like, why am I doing this? Like, this is not fun. This is stupid. Why am I, mm-hmm. why am I, this is not photography. Like, this is not why I got into photography. This is not enjoyable. Um, mm-hmm. So it was really, I'm really lucky that in 2017, I kind of had an aha moment um, here in Colorado where I went back to one of these spots that I went back to like over and over and over again. 
and I was shooting the same scene that everyone's always shot before, and I was bored with it. I mean, I was like, "This mm. is this is stupid. Why? This is a waste of time." You know, I, I literally I was like, "I'm gonna quit photography. This is burning me out. This, this is not fun. I haven't. This mm. is. I'm not getting anything out of this anymore." And I was like, "You know what? I'm just gonna hike up this trail. I don't even know where it goes, and let's see what happens. Let's see what I can discover. Right back to my roots." Mm. Back to mm, why I got mm. into this to begin with. And but I hiked up that trail and lo and behold, I found through a, some exploration off trail, this incredible vista that was just had this perfect composition uh, with a telephoto lens. And I spent probably six hours up there just shooting. Wow. And it was a shot that I've never seen anyone else shoot before. And it's one of my best selling images now and 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 those are the those are the moments that I look for now it's how can I combine my curiosity uh for nature and what I'm excited about and what I, what am I reacting to when I go out mm-hmm. with with those moments in time that are special with in places that are special and it doesn't have to be some epic place like um you know the dolomites or iceland or uh uh you know Torres del Paine or any of that stuff, yeah. you know, it can be yeah. literally, you know, an hour hike from your backyard. Um, but it's something you find that you react to that's special and it's interesting and the light's perfect and the moment's right. To me, that that is what's made, kept me excited um, in photography. So I, those are the moments that I look for now. Absolutely. You know, and again, a couple of things come out of that, I suppose, is that like, the, the, the honeypot locations are a honeypot location for a reason because they're beautiful, okay? That, let's face it, they are nice, okay? And everybody, I don't ever say to anybody, oh, don't get that shot. No, get that shot because you want to have your version of that shot. That's fine. But where the difference comes in, as you say, is going off that beaten track slightly and finding something unique to yourself. And you mentioned something here, which you know is very, very important to you and should be important to a lot of people as well, is about understanding nature and what role you have to play within nature and not to affect the natural environment by doing that to go find those locations because you know you might get a location i might find a location right that nobody else has seen and all of a sudden that now becomes something which is everybody wants to go and i think on the other evening when we were when you were talking there uh, on clubhouse I, i think it was alex had said it that he is feels responsible because he took one particular photograph and there was no footprints or anything that's out there, but all of a sudden, no, there are. So you're a co-founder of something which is really, really, really important, which is nature's first. And it's about putting nature first. And there's a certain guiding set of principles as well that you live by. And that, to me, I think, is very, very important from the photography world because a photographer, yes, they're taking a photograph, but you have to be conscious of the impact that you are going to have, not only then, but also in the future. I mean, everybody knows the whole idea of leave no trace. That's fine. That's then. But I'm amazed the times I go out to places that I wouldn't think somebody has been. And I find a can or a wrapper (laughs) or or whatever. You know what I mean? So people understand this stuff, but they don't live by it. So like maybe give us a bit more information there on Nature's First. How did that come about? And, you know, it is something that, again, we could have a podcast specifically on that as well, because it's a huge, huge topic. So. In it, and I don't want to say in a condensed way, but, you know, give us the he- the headlines, I suppose, really, Matt, on, on Nature's First. Sure. Yeah. So 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 really Nature First was kind of born out of this idea that as photographers, um, we kind of have a responsibility um, to be stewards of the places that we photograph. Right. And I think mm. uh, prior to social media, this wasn't really that big of a problem because, you know, people might see our pictures occasionally in a magazine or maybe in a photo- photography gallery. Um, and, and maybe one or two people might try to figure out where you took the photograph or ask you or something like that. But there wasn't this this idea of, you know, a viral um, exchange of information that we have now in, in the social media age. And, and you know, like if, if you have a million followers on Instagram and you share a video and you geotag it and it's really cool looking, that place is going to get destroyed. <laughs> I mean, mm. Let's just be honest. You're going to have millions yeah. of people see that video and they're going to go there because they want to go there too. Like it's really cool looking and they want to do it too. Um, and mm. that's totally human nature, right? We, you know, FOMO, we fear of missing out. We want to see it too. Absolutely. And yep, I, true story. Yeah. 
right? So um, really Nature First was born out of um, a personal experience that one of the co-founders had, Eric Stensland. And uh, he photographs um, a lot of kind of remote places in Rocky Mountain National Park here in Colorado. And there's a particular lake that he photographed. Um, and, you know, he was pretty, off, pretty far off the beaten path. And what he, he returned to it a couple of years later after he had photographed it. And it was in his gallery. Um, and people had seen it in his guidebook and stuff like that. And it was completely ruined. The, the wildflowers were completely trampled. You know, there's trash, there's human waste. Um, and he felt a personal responsibility that that he was the one that had kind of caused this to happen. Um, whether or not that's true or not, who knows? But he, he felt like he played a role in, in that happening. So mm -hmm. he basically assembled a group of um, about 10 of us um, here in Colorado to really try to tackle this problem. Like we want to ensure that the places that we photograph are preserved um, so that future people can experience them the same way that we've experienced them as well. And I think part of the challenge is if you're just now getting into photography and you go to a place that's on the map now that people know about, you may not have the same kind of experience that we've had maybe 10, 15 years ago where you could go to that place and it was a totally different experience. Mm, right, Joe. Yeah. Right? Like... Um, I remember the first time I went to a popular place here in Colorado called Ice Lake Basin. Super popular mm -hmm. now. It was it was on a Saturday in August, which is kind of prime time. It was me and like four other people all weekend. Now, if you go there, this is uh, what, eight years later, you you will see probably eight to 1200, 800 to 1200 people at that location because of Instagram wow. and social media. Um, and it's just not the same experience. And, mm. you know, the, the experience is different. The noise level is different. Um, the trash is there. The poop is there. The, mm. um, the wildflowers that you used to be able to photograph on the shores of the lake are no longer growing because um, it's high alpine tundra. So mm. I think the essence of Nature First is really to prioritize the well-being of nature over our photographs. And that's kind of the overarching principle uh, that we arrived at. And we've developed seven principles to help share and guide other photographers. And hopefully not just photographers, but pretty much anyone going out to beautiful places. Um, so the second mm -hmm. principle is to educate yourself about the places you photograph. I think for me, that's one of the most important ones because I feel like the more time you spend researching a place, you know, how do I get there? What are the uh, plants that grow there? When do they grow there? How fragile are those things? The more you learn about a place, the more you're going to understand how to protect it. Um, mm -hmm. so when you go there, you're like, oh, I should probably not step on that thing because I know it takes 10 years for it to grow back or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so the third one is to reflect on the possible impact of your, of your actions. Um, I mm -hmm. think that's a really important one because, mm -hmm. you know, if I do this and... I geotag this location and 20 people take a workshop here and um, then a thousand people show up. What's going to happen? Mm, mm, mm. Absolutely. It's going to be ruined for the next people. It's not even going to be there for the people after that as well, because as you say, you're not going to have the same experience if you visit it for the first time because it's now become popular. So it's, right. it's not going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah. not about keeping people from going outside or experiencing places. It's just about getting people to really just think about what their possible impact is going to have if they do share locations. And that that's the next uh, principle, you know, using discretion if you share locations. You know, obviously mm -hmm. there's locations that people know about, like uh, Tunnel View in Yosemite. Everyone knows Tunnel View in Yosemite. It's got a giant parking lot. It's got a huge railing. Yeah. It has the yeah. infrastructure to handle visitation. So mm -hmm. I have no problem when people are like, yep, took this one at Tunnel View Yosemite. That makes sense, right? But mm -hmm. if there's like a really off trail path you took to a really unique composition and you have like 100,000 Instagram followers and then you geotag it, mm -hmm. that place is going to get jacked. I'm like, mm -hmm. sorry, but it is. So maybe think twice mm -hmm. before you do that. Um, mm -hmm. The next one is know and follow rules and regulations. Um, I think that's 
mostly Except self-explanatory, yeah, should but, be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the next one is always follow leave no trace principles and strive to leave places better than you found them. So, you know, mm-hmm. I like to, I pick up a lot of trash when I'm out on my trips and I have a trash bag that I just throw stuff into. Um, I wish I didn't have to do that, but I do. Yeah. And then the yeah, last, it, it, uh, I was the, yeah, you. and then the last one is actively promote and educate others about these principles. So, um, I think we're up to 3,700, um, people in like 60 countries, something like that. So, Brilliant. Brilliant. and it, it Brilliant. doesn't cost money to join. It's really just saying I'm pledging that this, these principles resonate for me and, and I want to make, I want to make a difference too. So that's really what it's about. And I, I think, look, you know, it's a phenomenal idea. I think even just to break it down into the seven principles is something which is easy to remember. It's not long-winded or anything like that. A lot of it is common sense, but you can't teach common sense. So you kind of have to tell people in certain situations. And, you know, it's naturefirst.org, I think, is the it's a thing. Is that the- naturefirstphotography.org. Yeah, naturefirstphotography.org. I'll put uh, links to it as well in the show notes as well for the episode. But, you know, I mean, I heard you speak about it the other evening and you were passionate about talking about it. And I immediately went on and went, yeah, absolutely. I agree with all of this. No problem. Signed up for it straight away. I mean, there's nothing that I have to do differently than I've done already. But the only thing that's different now is that I talk to people about it more. So I think it's a very, very good idea. It's like I said, that's one that we could have a podcast directly on itself because there's multitudes of each of those principles that I think we could even discuss further into not minute details, but macro details, because people may not think that they're having an impact, but you are. And like there's many, many situations and places that once upon a time, I mean, nature has been around a lot longer than photography, but photography has done more damage to nature in a faster period of time than nature has taken to create it in the first place. And that's the point I think that we need to be conscious of. So, yeah, look, a phenomenal um cause and it's something i think that everybody should be aware of and try and live by those principles as much as this as much as they can so yeah and and, you know i i recognize the fact that i have an impact um i recognize the fact that every time i get in my car and travel and drive you know i'm burning fossil fuels and and every time i i walk off trail i'm having an impact on the vegetation uh but i'm doing it more consciously you know Mm. like last summer I, i found myself early June in the high country and there's a lot of uh, wildflowers and stuff. And I find myself very cognizant of where I walked, you know, it's like, okay, there's a huge marshy meadow of flowers here. I'm going to, I'm going to go around. I'm going to walk on the rocks. I'm going to try to avoid damaging things as best as I can. You know, it's Mm -hmm. really about mitigating our impact. You know, I don't think we can ever honestly ever unless we commit suicide (laughs) you know we're not going or stop taking pictures you know we're not going to have zero impact but i think Mm. there's a lot of things that we can do to um, collectively reduce our impact Mm. absolutely absolutely no phenomenal cause matt phenomenal cause so look matt what i'm going to do there is i'm going to take a very very quick break and uh, we'll be right back i want to discuss your podcast with you when we come back so we'll be right back after this if you're enjoying this episode of the Irish Photography Podcast, why not jump back and listen to the back catalogue we have of episodes, where you'll get some great insights from fantastic guests, gear reviews, lots of hints and tips, and above all else, keeping you company while you drive or relax. Thanks very much for listening. Please consider subscribing, leaving a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you're very welcome back to the Irish Photography Podcast. So Matt, like I said there in the first half, I wanted to discuss something with you, is that, you know, you are far more established in podcasting than me. And it's something that when I was gearing up to talk to you this evening, it was like as if I was talking to a legend because it's, I've heard your voice on many, many times and many occasions talking to many, many people. So tell me, I suppose, first and foremost, how did the podcast start? Yeah, man, it's, um, I started in 2017. So I was, uh, you know, I just moved here to Durango, Colorado, probably, uh, a year and a half before and um, I'd kind of mostly taken a relatively long hiatus from really engaging in photography you know I would go out on trips maybe a couple of times a year but it was it was pretty chill mm-hmm. and um, you know I was missing the photography and having conversations with a lot of other people because when I lived in Portland I was fairly well connected with a lot of photographers and we would talk a lot and go on trips a lot and stuff like that 
Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I remember I was uh, kind of disappointed in the podcast offerings. There really wasn't any way for me to kind of satiate my thirst in terms of um, listening to other people talk about photography and their experiences in photography. So I was like, you know what? Um, I'm going to create my own podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't I don't know anything about this. Um, I've never done it before, um, but I like talking a lot. I have a background in psychology and, you know, it's fun. So mm-hmm. um, I remember I was a, <laughs> I think at the time my son was like, mm, I think he was like nine or ten. Or eight or nine, I think. And he was playing basketball, and he hates basketball, and he's not good at basketball. So he was, we were just basically watching other kids play basketball. And we were at his basketball okay. game. And I decided to start taking notes on my phone of who I would invite on the podcast. And I think I created a document that had like 70 names on it of people that wow. I had followed or admired or friends of mine or, you know, just who I would think would be interesting to talk to. And then I just started doing research and figuring out how do you do a podcast and and um you know it had a pretty rocky start um i did a lot of cussing and swear words and storytelling and um Mm -hmm. it's definitely evolved quite a bit over the over the last gosh four years now um Mm -hmm. and uh but yeah i've tried to hard as i can to make it a consistent uh weekly podcast i'm pretty sure i haven't missed a week since 2017 so um wow. yes um and uh it's it's gosh man i i went into it with zero expectations zero goals um i didn't really know what would happen with it i had no thoughts on monetization or um using it to promote myself or promote other people it was really just a passion project a yeah let's mm-hmm. ha- i'm gonna have a chat with other people and just have fun with it. And um, it tell quick... me how did you, how did you come up with the name? Oh, cool. Yeah, my wife will like that you asked that. So my wife came up with the name. Um, okay. Well so done. I, wa- I wanted it to be um, kind of like a play on words, um, but not boring, uh, like the f- photo podcast or something like that. You know, I wanted mm-hmm, it to be. Mm-hmm kind of a like a double entendre or something like that yeah. so yeah left so, of center yeah 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 just something playful and my wife um you know i told her i threw out a bunch of words you know like aperture and f-stop and and exposure and all these you know photography words and she was like um well what about uh that vanilla ice song you know ice ice baby where he's like stop collaborate and listen so that's where it started f-stop collaborate and listen because it's it's kind of cool because it actually um, is what I wanted to do with the show. I wanted, you know, I wanted it to be about photography. So I stop. I wanted it mm-hmm. to be a collaboration with other photographers. Collaborate. And I want people to listen to it. So listen. So it's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It ticks all the boxes. It's, I mean, you know, I often wondered, because again, as I said, I've listened to a number of the podcasts over the years. I've often gone, where did he get the name from that? I mean, I must ask him actually. So now I've got the opportunity. So yeah, well done to your wife for coming up with it. It's, it's, it's a great name. It's catchy as it is. I mean, it's left to center. I mean, with my podcast, the Irish Photography Podcast, I mean, it does exactly what it says in the tin. It's a podcast. And there's Ireland, advantages to that too. I mean, when you first see mine, it's like, what's that about? You know what I mean? So yeah, um, yeah. there's an advantage for it to be very concrete as well. So, yeah, the only problem that I have with it is that the email address is too long. It's the Irish Photography Podcast at gmail.com. It's just too <laughs> long to type it every single time. You know? And every time you're logging in somewhere, you got to put in those current, current credentials. And it's like, oh, my God. And, every, and photography is always a word as well that when you're typing it, oh, you always have worst. to stop halfway through. Yeah, photography, four syllables, man. It's terrible. Yeah, always gets in the way. And I suppose, you know, um, you've over 200 episodes recorded thus far, which is phenomenal. I mean, as you say, you haven't missed a week since 2017. Um, I was doing weekly, and then last November, I changed it to every fortnight, just purely because I said, okay, it's I'm already doing my YouTube channel every week already, so it's a huge amount of thing. It's a part-time gig for me, so I don't earn anything from it, so I said, okay, I'm going to go fortnightly. But of the 200 that you have done, what has been, you know, I suppose a personal highlight to you out of the 200 so far? Oh, man, personal highlight. That's a tough one. Um, First one? You know, I think it's pro- probably my favorite episode that um, 
if I were to be honest, it also really helped shape a lot of my personal opinions on the state of photography. And that was the episode I did with Alex Nail and Aaron Bobnick. Um, and okay. it was it was a post processing debate, mm-hmm. um, and uh, I basically just tried to moderate it as best <laughs> I could from a neutral mm-hmm. position. And at the time, um, I was fairly neutral on that particular topic myself. And uh, I found that just hosting that particular episode and then um, my subsequent thoughts afterwards, it really helped shape my own direction in photography. You know, there's been other episodes that really um, have helped kind of shape the direction of my photography. I really enjoyed the episode I did with um, uh, John Barkley um, because he's all about contemplative, um, you know, slow, slower photography. And I, Mm -hmm. I try to try to practice that um, when I can. Um, But really, like, you know, as you probably know, the the joy of doing a podcast is that you get to learn something new every single week, whether it's something big or something small that you can kind of augment your own thinking or your practices with. I really Mm -hmm. think that is the biggest benefit that I've had from from doing the podcast. And um, so I'm just thankful to be able to do them week in, week out. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting you say it there that, you know, it's from the psychology point of view, like the, the thinking about something more gives us more mass in it and as, as opposed to just a throwaway comment. And I think what I've learned from it and what I like about the podcasting world is that I get to meet people like you. I get yeah. to talk one-on-one to people like you. I get to learn things from people like you. It actually helps me more. But I've often wondered, and it's a question I'm going to ask you as well, is you know, do you find that you get more from the podcast or your audience can get more from the podcast? Yeah, you know, I think it depends um, on the episode. You know, if it's something that I'm already very familiar with or have already invested my time or effort or thinking into, then, you know, I'm sure that the audience is going to get more out of that one. But if it's something that that's new to me or maybe it's a different viewpoint that I haven't um, considered before, um, I obviously get a tremendous value out of those conversations. Um, you know, I remember uh, one that I had with Brooks Jensen. It was uh, I remember going into it, not knowing where it was going to go. And literally the entire time I was like, this is gold. That's gold. Everything you just like, everything he said was just so impactful to me. And so I think it has the benefit of doing both just depending on the topic or the guest or, or, or the direction that it takes. And, and I don't know about mm-hmm. you, but, um, uh, for my podcast, you know, I do have an outline that I, that I create beforehand with, you know, topics and things of that nature, but, I also kind of just let it go where it goes. And and oftentimes I find that's where a lot of the really great stuff comes is from that off the beaten path, didn't know that was going to happen uh, type mm-hmm. stuff. So so I really enjoy enjoy it when the conversations kind of deviate from what you were expecting. 100%, you know, I mean, even when I prepare for a podcast, as you know, we're doing it right now. I mean, I prepare questions, which I always have personal to the person, but they're just lead-ins because it's, it's the sidetrack that you can go off in. And if I didn't have my questions to bring me back into it again, I could go off in a tangent. And yeah. before I realized that I'm going, Jesus, what was I going to ask here? So that's what I love about it because like you and I are just having a chat right now. But of course, I'm steering the conversation because I know where the conversation is going to go. You know where the conversation is going to go as well because I've shared the questions with you. But it's the pieces in between. It's the the funny anecdotes that you didn't even think were going to come out and the nuggets, as you say, that's gold. I mean, that's what I love about it because it's it's expected, but it's not expected at the same time. And that's the part that I love most in relation to it because you never know where it's going to go. I mean, I've never, you know, I've never met you. I've never had a conversation with you, but I could, I could have met you virtually here today and we could have been stonewalling each other. There'd be nothing. Or it could be like it is right now as we're just having a conversation. We're just having a conversation that flows. And that's what I enjoy most about it, because from the audience listening into it as well, you know, I always try and think to ask the question that the audience would like to ask the person. Mm -hmm. And if I can nail that, then it's beneficial to the audience. Now, it's difficult for me to get into the head of somebody who I've never met from an audience point of view. So what I've often done on some occasions is that I'll ask friends or I'll ask people in our Facebook group that we have. I've got this guest coming up. What would you like to ask? Because that way, then. I may not have thought of a question, that, but somebody else is important. And I go, geez, that's a great question. And that's what I love about it, because you are just having a chat, but you're having a chat about a common topic, which is photography. Right. And you can tell every person that you're talking to 
they're passionate about photography. Yeah. And if I'm, I'm passionate about photography, so straight away there's something that we've got in common and that's what I love in relation to it. So it's, it's, it's something I wouldn't change. I mean, we're at 100, 134 episodes so far and I sometimes go, how did I get to those numbers? It doesn't seem as if it's a huge chunk. I mean, we started it in September 18 um, and we were weekly every single week. But like I say, we changed it there now last uh, November to every two weeks. But even at that, I've had guests on that have come back and come back again sure. because we've had such a great laugh and such a good crack and such like that. And it's just having the chats. And I get to you know, call people that I've never met, but I'm friends with them now because I still talk to them after the podcast is recorded. So for me, it's beneficial to me, but I think from the audience as well, it's something that if they get something out of it, then that's a win-win situation. That's where I'd kind of go against my philosophy from photography is don't shoot for the gallery. I'm making the podcast for the gallery but mm-hmm. also for me. But if the gallery is not enjoying it, then it's only a one-man show, really, and that's not going to be of much interest to the audience, I right. don't think, you know? Yeah, that is yeah. a that's a tough balance to strike. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I can only speak for myself, but I know I don't always tick, you know, I don't always get there. As oftentimes, I'll get, me or and or the guests will get stuck on a topic that maybe the audience isn't that interested in. And, you know, sometimes that just happens, and that's just the way that the conversation flows. And, I'm sure that um, you know, as a host, that sometimes it's hard to rein people in. <laughs> yeah, can be. But then there can be times as well where you can get a guest that makes it so easy for you. You know, you ask yeah. a question and they go off in a 10, 10 minute monologue and it's perfect. You Absolutely. Go, okay, this is the easiest one ever, you know. So then you get people as well that you kind of have to draw, you have to kind of lead them in. And that's because they're not used to having this situation. That's fine. I mean, okay, I'm used to it at this stage. But I'm sure you're like me. Before you start the podcast, you've got certain things that are going through your head. You're going, okay, what if, what if, what if? But you can never predict what ifs, what they're going to be. You just sit back and enjoy it. You know. So, yeah, I think I've, I've really, really enjoyed your podcast anyway, over the years. So, yeah, well done on what you've created. Thank you. I was curious, um, my own, I don't know, just for my personal satisfaction or curiosity, do you find that having the podcast and, you know, the you're frequently talking and thinking about photography. Do you ever find that that uh, has a negative impact on you in terms of like, God, I really just want to talk about movies or beer or <laughs> something. Like, do you ever just get sick of talking about photography? It, it, it's, yeah, do you know what? It's a very, very good question. I mean, photography consumes me, right? It's my release sure. from the world. Same, right? yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, I enjoy talking about it all day long. And I mean, when we first set up the podcast, myself, dear mate, another guy, John, we, we'd always talk to each other about photography on a regular basis. So we said, sure, we're just shooting the SH1T here. Why don't we just start recording it? And yeah. it, it, it hasn't changed for me. And like, we'll touch on something in a moment as well, which is in the, the, the new kid in town, the whole clubhouse situation, right? Sure. I mean, I'm in that and I'm only on photography. So like, I make videos once a week for my YouTube channel. I started that in September 17. I haven't missed a week yet. I've got the um, uh, the podcast, which is every two weeks. And now every Friday night as well, I've got a room on Clubhouse as well that I just, again, shoot the SH1T. But it's just talking photography. And it it never bores me. It's something that I love endlessly. I think it's it's phenomenal, you know? So I don't know. I, 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 wouldn't, I don't say I'd get bored with it, but at the same time, if somebody is not interested in photography, then it's difficult for them to listen to me talk about it so much. And I think that's where the challenge is, you know. I, yeah. my, my wife, you know, she, as, as supportive as she is, I might go off out for a shoot and I come back and I go, she's watching think of this image. She goes, yeah. And I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. I think it's beautiful. He goes, yeah, it's just, yeah. Or the flip side to that is I'll start thing, telling a story about photography and I could see she's not interested in it. Like, so there's yeah. no point in me continuing that conversation. Sounds like your wife and my wife get along pretty well. Yeah, my wife's American anyway, so yeah. So I mean, I, there's a commonality there, I think, in the first instance, yeah. Um, and I suppose, you know, if I can deviate away from the podcast for a moment, sure, right? Sure, yeah, um, yeah. I kind of want to talk and bring it into your photography because we haven't really talked much about your photography as such. We've talked about the journey of photography. We've talked about the psychology of and the feelings of photography. But your work, let's face it, I mean, your shots are phenomenal. Okay, the oh, detail that are within your images, the composition are within your images. And it's not just me saying it. I mean, you've been recognized by many awards over the years, right? And I think it's a question I thought of when I want, well, sorry, a question I want to ask you when I thought of it was, do you think that your photography 
or anybody's photography, should it be influenced by recognition for competitions or awards? Should they shoot for an award to go out and go, I got to get this shot because it's going to get me X, Y, and Z placement and such and such? Or do I go get my photos and then afterwards go, I might enter that in just see how it gets on. I mean, talk me through there. I think your thoughts from photography and awards and, and, and that side of things. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I think um, f- I think it's really important that our motivation be intrinsic, um, you know, in terms of making images that we like, um, that are personally expressive, that uh, speak to us, um, that uh, mean something to us, uh, that maybe for whatever reason, you know, we value it, whether it's a reminder of an experience or um, it takes us back to a place that we really would like to go back to or you know or it's expressing an emotion or it's telling a story i think those intrinsic motivations are critical i think that um, people can get stuck in some really bad traps mentally and psychologically if they're shooting for others Um, whether that be uh, for print sales or customers or competitions or social media likes i think that um I think that can really, um, I, can, I, I personally think that can really stifle creativity. I think mm-hmm. it can also um, take you off the path that um, is that would maximize your enjoyment. I think it can really um, get you in kind of a negative space. Um, mm-hmm. I personally have been down that road before. I think, um, if I were to be honest, my photography from 20... 12 to 2016 was all about that. Um, it was all okay. about p- pleasing social media and creating images that I thought would look cool on social media or get likes and comments and shares and um, becoming popular. And when I look back at those photos, and most of them aren't very good, um, they're over-processed, they are derivative of other people's work. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just not, they're not me. They're not, they don't speak much about who I am as a photographer. Um, yeah, there's some photos in that period that deviate from that, except there are exceptions to that. But um, I think it can really take you down a dark place um, in your work. And, um, you know, to address your question about um, the effect of competitions on um, photographers, I think f- competitions um, is kind of a double-edged sword. And I speak mm-hmm. to that from someone who has entered competitions and someone who has has just created a new competition uh, as uh-huh. well. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, um, if you think about it as artists, we're constantly competing as is, unless we're not interested in showing our work to other people or, or if we're not ever interested in monetizing or having anyone ever see our work. You know, we're competing Correct, for yeah. attention. We're competing for social media uh, views. Um, we're comp- like if you ever wanted your photographs exhibited in a gallery or a museum or a show, you're competing against other people who are entering to do the same. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think that should be your primary motivation for why you make a particular photograph. Um, so I think competitions can just be a healthy way of kind of evaluating where you're at with your work. Um, mm-hmm. And Um, Maybe that's a good segue to talk about the competition that we've created, the Natural Landscape Photography Awards, because what we've wanted to do is to create a space for photographs that are that don't rely on heavy editing and manipulation to rise to the cream of the crop. Um, You know, we want to we want to celebrate photographs and photographers that, um, you know, it's capturing the landscape as it was experienced as it was seen, as it was actually photographed. And, um, and you know, we have a golden rule. It's that the integrity of the subject should be maintained. So, you know, we're going to be looking at raw files. and um, But what we found is, and I don't know if this has been your experience, uh, but kind of over the last 10 years, the types of photographs that kind of get elevated to popularity um, are those that have been kind of hyper manipulated and, don't necessarily represent something you can actually see in nature ever. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm, It's mm -hmm. stuff that's, you know, people are dropping in different skies. They're, you know, they're swapping in different foregrounds. They're 
time blending different scenes from different places um, to kind of create this artistic masterpiece. And I think that type of work has a place, um, mm -hmm. but it kind of drowns out the work that um, other people are trying to do um, that's more traditional, that's more um, expressive of what's actually experienceable in nature. And so we really want to just create a space for that type of work to be celebrated. And um, I think that's where competitions can have a, a, a strong influence on the direction of any given art form. You know, you look at film, you have the Academy Awards and the Oscars, and, you know, there's different categories like documentary and, and, and you know... Special effects. Special effects. And, you know, it doesn't make much sense that a... Um, something that had amazing special effects would win a, the best documentary of the year. So yeah. um, we've kind of thought through some of those things as well. We have different categories. We have an aerial category. We have a intimate and abstract category. We have a night photography category. You know, we have a, a aerial category. So we, we want to um, create a space for different genre subgenres of landscape and nature photography to be celebrated um, without the need for, kind of this hyper-realistic perfection that we're seeing popularized um, within the media of landscape photography over the last 10 years. And not to say that those images aren't fantastic and wonderful and amazing in their own right, um, but let's admit it, uh, if you have a really simple uh, but per personally expressive scene of maybe a crashing wave um, on the coast mm -hmm. of Ireland, it's really hard for that image to get eyeballs uh, against something that's maybe 42 instances of a crashing wave at different light times of the day with a mm. Milky Way from South Africa dropped over top of it um, mm. with mm -hmm. wildflowers mm -hmm. from uh, the Dolomites dropped in the corner. Like mm -hmm. this perfect painted scene, you know, it's really hard to compete against that. Um, when you're trying to do more more natural work, you know, hence the name Natural Landscape Photography Awards. So, so we just want to create a space for that. Um, and I think competition can be healthy. Um, competition can also shape the direction of what people are excited about. So, I I love the idea of it because you know in this day and age when we think about where people are posting their images and sharing their images, they're sharing them on social media. Absolutely. And if people are processing their images for Instagram, for example. I, I did an experiment. I've got one image. In fact, I only posted it there only during the week. And it was an image that I purposely oversaturated, purposely. And I said, I'm going to do a test here and see if I oversaturate an image and put it up on Instagram, will it do better than a shot that I have, don't have oversaturated? And guess what? It did because Instagram likes colors. And that's something which can change somebody's direction of their processing. Now, if somebody is doing that all the time and they're putting the saturation slider not up to 10, okay, they've learned. They only go as far as seven and a half now because they've got experience, right? But, you know, that that's not true to the image and it's not true to the form and it's not true, I don't think, to what attracted them to the scene in the first place unless they were looking at that scene and saying, okay, I can see there's something here, but I've got the idea. I'm going to go with Luminar and I'm going to drop in a sky in the back room because or, I know exactly what it needs. Or light like rays. Yeah, or that exactly. Don't right? exist, or you know, that don't whatever. exist. Yeah. So, like the other the other point, then I suppose just from the, the 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 competition point of view, though, I think maybe you've got experience with it. People can change their photograph for a competition once they know who the judges are, hmm. so that they'll process the image to a degree that they know will appeal to a certain judge, and that in itself can also then end up manipulating your own style of photography because that judge may like it and you go, okay, I must do that now going forward. But that's not true to who you are. And then you're going on off in this this direction because of somebody who you wanted to influence to like your image. But again, like we say, it should be shooting for yourself, not for the gallery or not for the judge. And I think that's something where you get, you know, someone says that's a competition shot. It's something that would be worthy of a competition. Okay, that's somebody's opinion. It could go into a competition. The judges may not even look at it because it doesn't stand out for what they're looking for within that genre or subgenre. So the competition world, I think, is something which is fascinating. It is scary to a lot of people. It's exhilarating to a lot of other people. But it is something I think that, you know, we have to be conscious of from a photography point of view for the very nature of photography itself. 
if you want to go off and enter a competition on post-processing and surrealism, great. Then take all those items you mentioned a moment ago, bring all those blended into one image, and boom, you have that fantastic image that you're looking for. But I like the idea of this contest because it's natural. And I think that's an important one. If you're going to be looking at the raws as well, you'll be able to see exactly what was done and what was manipulated going into the image. And that's something that not all competitions would do. Well, yeah, I mean, we see that in a lot of existing competitions where you have, <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, as photographers, we've been to these places. We know what they look like, right? And, you know, who's consuming or looking at the, the results of competitions? It's other photographers, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, but for me, it's pretty infuriating to see an image win a competition um, where you know it doesn't look it's like clear. that at all you know it, it's, it's clear, yeah. and, and it's like what is the heck what the heck like do these judges just not know that that place doesn't even look remotely close to that or do they just not care um mm. and so i guess it comes down to what you value um in your photography right some people don't care right and that's totally fine if, if you don't think that um photographic art or landscape or nature photography should have a basis in representing the subject that it actually um, is of, mm. then that's fine. That, that, you know, that's, that's what you like to consume. That's the type of photography that you like to look at. But for me, um, maybe it's just because of my early uh, upbringing of uh, being obsessed with nature and place and experience. I really, really, really appreciate photography that um, is able to harness um, what a place actually is like um, and do it in a way that's personally expressive or creative, um, but, that, but that then doesn't rely on kind of magic tricks to make it look better, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that's, unfortunately, that's what popularization has done to a lot of landscape photography right now is that it's, it's celebrating magic tricks in Photoshop and Lightroom and Luminar. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what people are getting excited about on Instagram. And I want people to be excited about um, quieter scenes. I want people to be excited about stuff that actually was seen and experienced and noticed by people and were captured in a, in a, in a great way and maybe processed in a really subtle um, but powerful and expressive way. I want that photography to be what people um, celebrate. So that's mm. what it's about mm. for me. And um, I'm hoping that the competition is a vehicle by which we can see that change happen. And I'm yeah, not saying perfect. I'm not saying that other stuff shouldn't exist or shouldn't be celebrated. It's just not the stuff that I like. And so mm. I want to see the stuff that I like get celebrated. Absolutely. You know, and something that comes to mind here is that if I if I go out for argument's sake to take a photograph with you and we both go to the same place and you're the naturalist and I'm the person that wants to go off and add in all these crazy other things, we're both going to have completely different images. Now, you're going to look at my image and go, Darren, it didn't look like that, man. And I'm, I'm going to look at yours and go, yeah, but yours was boring. But it, that's fine. Like, that's because I do what I like and you do what you like. But I mean... When you're sure. having people, and when people go together, I think that also helps people. And it's something I want to discuss about workshops as an example. Like, if I go out in a workshop and I'm with four other people, I'm not necessarily only learning from the workshop leader. I'm learning from the people that are with me. And I'm learning styles from their photography as well. And that's something that can help because when it can also hinder, by the way, because when you bring it back to a competition, if I go out with four people and I'm shooting for a competition, I will never show my image to the other three people because that's going to be mine and it's only going to be shown when it gets to the contest. And that's when the green-eyed monster effectively can come out. So from a workshop point of view, what's your experience been of that over the years? Hmm. Well, what, what, I'm not totally sure what your question is because um, I could take this in a couple of different directions. Take it whatever direction you want to take it in. Okay. Well, I guess as it relates to competitions, um, what I have seen happen in a lot of competitions is that um, people that were on the same workshop are submitting photographs to the same competitions and you're seeing mm -hmm. them do well. Um, and that's really interesting because um, on one hand, I guess from a competition perspective, I personally kind of value 
um, originality and someone's own ability to make a photograph on their own over somebody who paid somebody thousands of dollars to take them to a place and show them where to point the camera. Um, I, it, to me, it's, it's, I mean, this is maybe a little controversial, man, but go with it. <laughs> if somebody wins a competition on a, with a photograph that, that they got on a workshop and maybe the workshop leader helped them process that photograph, should we really be saying that that person deserves an award for that? Um, over somebody who's working on their own and has a, st- um, you know, put in the work to scout it. Um, there's a, I mean, there's a lot of things that go into the final image, right? Mm-hmm, and absolutely. to say that we're going to value a photograph and a photographer who has relied on others to create that image. Get that end result. Yeah, yeah, I don't know, man. That, um, to me, that's, um, and that's, and I say that because I know that's actually happened. Um, Mm -hmm. in other competitions before, like, um, and I think it was the, um, someone was telling me the wildlife photographer of the year award a couple of years ago, um, the same exact, um, photo workshop of like, a like an Arctic Fox or something, a bunch of people in that workshop submitted it and like the same photo from multiple people got to like the final end stage of the competition and so it's like um do we really want to be saying that um that that's what it that's what we should be rewarding people for is spending a bunch of money to get good shots or should we rewarding people that have been doing it for a long time who are creative and original and creating unique stuff that only they have seen and done to me that's more valuable but how do you know that um as a judge right yeah, you, you don't. It's hard. Yeah, you yeah. Don't. But the only I don't, way that you'll notice, the only way you'll notice if you see multiple iterations of more or less a very similar shot. Yeah, I think that's where you come to say like something's fishy here. Um, mm. And actually, mm. I think we have put a, a very specific rule in our competition to say that um, it must be a, a photograph that that you are the one that was responsible for creating it. Um, mm. Take that mm. as you will. Well, you know what? Look, it's really, really important because, again, you know, if you go off out and you've got an instructor telling you where to point the camera, what settings you need to use, and they're also helping you do the post-processing, then it's not your image, it's your instructor's image. It's just been taken on the camera body that you actually happen to own. And that's just the reality of the situation. And you never know that by looking at a raw image. You know, something that comes to mind here was the Nikon contest there, that one with the plane that was photoshopped in, 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 in the top of the buildings. And, I mean, surely be to God there should have been something that the general public was able to do that should have been happening during the judges there is to zoom in and check was there anything that was a pixel off here or a pixel around the plane or whatever but that's where manipulation come into it because it can fool people and you know being true to the form and being true to the location and being true to the light and being true to everything of nature itself i think is a far better image than something which has been coerced into it you know at the end of the day it's about what do you want to um celebrate right and there's nothing wrong with celebrating um people's artistic achievements um with digital art right Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think the challenge becomes is that you're then you're then saying like well if you want to win a competition you have to be good at digital art right you have to be good at at these skills and if you're not good at those skills you're not going to win a competition and i think where we're coming at this from is um, we, we think that there are other things in photography that we want you to be good at in terms of originality and composition and light and putting in the work and um, creative expression and storytelling and being in the right place at the right time and all of those things. Like those are the things that we want to see rewarded. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And look, and you know what? At, at, at the end of the day, if you get a banger of an image, you've got a banger of an image. It is incredible, a photograph. It doesn't need to be recognized within a contest to tell you that it is a banger. It's great. And you got it yourself. You created it yourself. You processed it yourself. It's your image. And I think that's something which I, my personal view in it is that I would prefer to have that image that I knew I created myself rather than have somebody create it in parallel with me 
and then them not get the credit because I would be going, hang on, I'd want to give the credit there to Jimbo because Jimbo is the guy that did this. But you can't do that when it comes to a contest as well. So, yeah, I think it's quite interesting. Uh, you know, just the different thought processes that are around contests. I mean, I think you'd be yeah. surprised at how many photographs win competitions or are in the finalists that it's not their own creation or somebody else processed it. Um, yeah, the collaboration of sorts. Yeah. yeah, and I, I don't know. I get, maybe I'm old fashioned, but to me, that's like running a race. But somebody else, somebody else's shoes or something. I don't know. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't feel ethical to me to 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 enter a competition and win it when somebody else did all the hard work. Absolutely. But but that's Absolutely. me, man. I don't know. That's I'm sure there's people listening that'll be like, eh, who cares? I don't. I don't know. I've always look taken the high road, but yeah, and I mean, look, you know, the, the high road is a good road to take, but sometimes you have to take the middle road as well to understand why somebody is taking the lower road. So just so you can get into their head and figure it out, because everybody's motivation is going to be different. Absolutely, some people may not think, you know, some people may not think they've got the processing skills, and they just don't don't bother to learn it because they'll get somebody else to do it for them. That's the easy route out. But if somebody always, you know, ties your shoelaces for you, you will never know how to tie your shoelaces when the time is needed. And that's the problem, I think, um, that, you know, we can go off and we can create these beautiful images, but it's not true to what the actual image should be, was or could have been in reality. So, yeah, no, very interesting. And I think that's a very good in, uh, idea for a contest as well, uh, Matt. And I'm looking forward to kind of, you know, hearing more about it as the time will go on as well. So, yeah, well done for setting that up. Yeah, it's, um, uh, June 1st is when we start opening it up for uh, submissions and you can join our mailing list to get some early bird discounts as well. And our goal is to create a really um, high end fine art book with stories and judge judge essays from judges and, and from the founders. And we really want it to be of high quality and of value to people that enter the competition. I mean, our goal is to make it to where anyone who enters the competition at the, at the highest level is able to get the book, um, for at no cost so we really mm. it's really mm. you know it's unfortunate but people think that people just create competitions to make a bunch of money and that's not that's not why we're doing this at all we we want it to be for and by the community and really celebrate the work that we want to see um mm. celebrated. Absolutely. and yeah and you know it's interesting you mentioned about a book there because something i wanted to talk to you about was printing because you know you've mentioned it a couple of times here there was a couple of images that your best-selling print you know, all of your images, I believe, are for sale from a printed point of view. So tell me, like, how important is printing in photography, in your opinion? Yeah, man, I personally, I mean, it's kind of next level. You know, you, if you just create it for social media or for your website or whatever, that's cool. That's great. That's awesome. But um, I got to tell you, like, until you've seen a huge print of yours, you know, a 40 by 60 or something like that on really awesome mm -hmm. paper. And you've put in the work to make sure that it's properly sharpened and, and, and that the exposure is correct for print. And, you know, you've done it the way that it should be done. It's, um, I mean, it, it's like the difference between writing a musical composition and having an orchestra play it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. really, I think Ansel Adams said the, what is it the um the the film is the the what is it, what was it the film is the score but the print is the performance yes and i think i think that's exactly right i mean it's um once you see your work printed um and and you see it hanging on your wall or somebody else's wall i mean there's so many there's so much value in that you know it's so it's it's gratifying you feel a sense of accomplishment um, it gives you something to, to look forward to. It gives you something to push kind of your own boundaries on. I, you know, it's a whole other level of, um, mm -hmm. of where to take your work. So, so I really encourage people to, to, to dip your toes in printing and, and really give it a shot and give it a go. It can be really daunting. It can be really challenging. There's a lot of failure involved in printing. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of stuff that even I surprise myself with on occasion where you, you maybe didn't notice that thing. Um, you know, I have a print that I just printed that's 30 by 45 and on the screen it looks flawless. And when I printed it, there's this um, bush, this this branch of this bush that's just super 
obvious. I'm like, why did I not see that? <laughs> you know, it's um, <laughs> when you see it printed, it, like it's a whole new level of um, just yeah. enjoying it and seeing it and and also monetizing it, you know. Well, you know, they say an image doesn't come to life until you print it. And in reality, printing your own images can be very, very rewarding, but it is very, very daunting. And, like, you know, I have a printer here. Uh, I rarely print images now. And, and that's a problem because when I turn on the printer, it now has to clean all the heads. So it wastes <laughs> a hell lot of ink. And, and all of a sudden I'm buying ink and I'm after printing off three or four images. And it says low ink. I'm like, what do you mean low ink? Like I haven't even used so, this thing. Exactly, you know, and like, and you say, you know, changing the exposure for print because most of the time you print your image looks perfectly on the screen and it comes out dark. You're like, what? You yeah, mean? and that's where the frustration can come in. And like, once you can get over those, I can absolutely see because I have some images that I printed here and I look at them regularly as I walk by them and I kind of go, yeah, I nailed that one. That was good because you know, I think looking at a screen as well of an image, it's not exactly a true representation until it's printed itself. Um, and something, you know, I mentioned again on a previous podcast with other guests about, you know, books and such like that. There's a tactile feel to feeling a book. There's a tactile connection by holding a print. You, you, we live in a world at the moment where it's swipe. You're swiping to the next image, to the next, but you're not stopping to take in the image and actually dissect the image, look at it in a bit more detail. But on the flip side to that, when you start printing an image, and this is a trap I fell into. I really started to look at it at the screen. And I remember, again, I'd mentioned it before, but um, I was agonizing over one image. And I was like, oh, Jesus, man, it's not sharp. It's not sharp. And my wife came in. She goes, what's wrong with you? Ah, oh, the image isn't sharp. She goes, how far in are you zoomed? And I went, I'm not that far. She goes, zoom out. So I zoomed out. And the rock that I was so fixated with, you couldn't even see the rock. But I was just so much into the detail. And that's when you start printing an image, as you say, properly sharpened. You're never two inches away from looking at an image. You're normally a couple of feet back. So even if there are small little imperfections, you will never really see it because when you're printing it, even when you're printing it big, you're still not looking at it that close as you're looking at it on the screen. But Yeah, know. it's it's interesting because I think a lot of people like to obsess over um, details and zooming in at 400%. And, you mm -hmm. know, and, and there's some value to doing some of that. But at the end of the day, you know, typically we're enjoying photographs from a distance, right? You know, from, mm -hmm. I mean, at the very least, you're like a couple of feet away. If it's a large print, you're probably looking at it from across the room or maybe mm -hmm. like five or six or 10 feet away. And you're not going to notice a lot of those imperfections. So what I tell people is, um, you know, don't, don't let perfect get in the way of good, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's you're you're going to print it, you're going to look at it and you're going to step back and it's you're going to feel a sense of pride. You're going to feel a sense of accomplishment. And you might say, oh, you might learn something, too, like, oh, I need to maybe brighten up the shadows or I, maybe like the highlights are blown out. Like depends on what medium you're printing on. I mean, there's a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, um, just don't let perfect get in the way of good enough, I think, when it comes mm -hmm. to printing. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, great advice. Great advice. You know, and like, and looking at the images, like I said to you earlier there on your website, I mean, those are phenomenal images and I'm sure they would look incredible in large format. So even the one you printed there, 30 by 45 and that, that bush that you're seeing, you're probably looking at that, but the person that gets it won't even notice that. And that's where totally. I think the difference of it comes in, you know? So yeah, I mean, well done on your images. Your f photography is phenomenal. You've got some incredible images of mountains that I could only ever dream of and it's no harm for you to do that because you've climbed pretty much all the ones around you anyway so <laughs> you know you're, and as you say going back to a place on a number of times to get the right conditions that's what it's about you know like you might find something and go I know when that's going to be right now that I found it all I have to now do is wait for the right light because I'm not trying to find the composition anymore and I think you know from a photography point of view very rewarding and again you know when somebody buys a print from you and puts it up on the wall then that's fantastic you know, so well done. Fantastic yeah. work. Um, Thank you. I have one I have one final question here before we go for our last break. Right. And we alluded to the moment to go here, which is uh, Clubhouse. So Clubhouse is the new kid on the block. It's the new social media. It's the new social network and such like that. Um, I heard you speak on Wednesday evening 
And it prompted me to say, OK, I must get in touch with Matt and we see if we can get him on for a chat. I mean, oh, four days later, five days later, we're, we're on a podcast together. So, like, what's your thoughts on uh, Clubhouse? I've got mine, but I'll share that, I suppose, afterwards. We briefly touched it in, in chat anyway, but what's your thoughts on the new kid on the block Clubhouse? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a unique uh, product on the marketplace. That I, I actually don't even personally consider it social media. You know, I think it's a it's a tool, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, all social media is a is a tool to some degree or another, but I think Clubhouse is kind of unique in in, in what it offers to um, the marketplace, especially for photographers or entrepreneurs or or people that just want to learn. So, I think it's a actually a really fantastic platform. Um, I think it's really great at building. Um, relatively instant uh, community um, because mm. you can create these clubs and you can have people come in and then they get notified that other people that they follow are in that room and they can join them and listen to them. I think it's a really awesome platform um, in terms of kind of, um, how do I say this, giving you access to big names, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't, mm-hmm. that's going to sound kind of egotistical because I don't see myself that way but like you know at any given time you can jump on clubhouse and oh there's somebody that i know that has a million followers on instagram and i can hear them talk about something um Mm -hmm. so it's you know and you can talk to them as well and you you yeah you can get up on stage and you can ask them a question or i think it's a very um welcoming platform in that regard i think it's also kind of refreshing as opposed to traditional social media because it's got the person's name and their photo and their profile and they are talking in their own voice and so there's a little Mm -hmm. bit more accountability for behavior and for Mm -hmm. kind of you know um what how do i say this um accountability overall i suppose and responsibility well i mean in terms of like you know, how you treat other people. Um, you know, it's not like yeah. social media where, yeah, but then there's also Keyboard warriors. Yeah. And you're also yeah. hearing people's voice and you can hear the kind of the, the inflection of their voice. And you, there's a little bit less misunderstanding of what people are trying to convey in what they're describing. Whereas on social media, you can read it and you think they're shouting, but really they're yeah. just like really passionate about conveying their opinion. And on clubhouse that comes through much more differently and much more organically. So, um, mm. I think it's a really cool platform. Um, I think um, you know, one of the things we had talked about on Wednesday was, you know, is it going to compete with podcasts? I think, I think if anything, they're two different things. You know, podcasts are yeah. kind of more timeless. Um, you can listen to them anytime in your car, while you're driving, whatever. Um, and I think they're just different. And I, I, I like to think of club as something as kind of building relationships and augmenting other experiences and ways to learn from others. And, um, mm. you know, I, I think it's a cool platform, though. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's very, very interesting so far. I mean, it's been around, I believe, since last August. I only heard about it in January or February or something like that. It was Bernard, actually, a friend of mine. He was chatting with you on that room in Kai's room on Wednesday. And he invited me on to, he said, you must check this out. He said, it'd be a good way to promote the podcast. I went, what do you mean promote the podcast? I had never thought about it promoting the, co- the podcast. So I went on and I started listening and then I went, okay, this is interesting. And, you know, I think where the difference is, is that, as you say, it, it, it's live. It's off the cuff. There's nothing scripted. Yes, there's questions and some rooms have a structure. But the answer is you don't know who's going to go on the stage. You don't know what they're going to say. You don't know what their interaction is going to be. It is a very good sense of community. The disadvantage that I see with it is that if you're not in, you can't win. I mean that from an audience point of view. You can't replay it later. So that's where a podcast comes in that you can binge listen, you know. And I get a number of people listen to my podcast and they'll go, and I've listened to four in a row. Or so there was one, one guy there around six months ago, he found one podcast. He goes, I got to go back and listen to all the other ones. I think we had 100 and, oh, sorry, about 101 podcasts or something done. And he went back and he listened to all the other podcasts. And that's great to be able to have that because it is a depository of all that work and that content that you can go back. And as you said earlier, somebody might give a nugget of information. But you, there was somebody on one of the rooms I was listening the other evening and they said a statistic. But I didn't hear the statistic properly. And I wanted to rewind it, but I couldn't rewind it because it's live. And that's where I think it has a potential disadvantage, but also... You are, you're not in the room. You're not going to know the conversation. But you have got a phenomenal platform, I think, um, there that the average Joe Blogs 
can listen in. You know, there, there's a guy, there was one of the rooms I saw there, the guy that created the TV show Entourage, Doug Ellen. Uh, I was thinking, Doug Ellen is chatting. I went, what? Ah, that can't be. And I go in, there's Doug Ellen. He's talking to other people about you know, how they produced Entourage. I'm like, Jesus, man, this is, this is insane, the potential that it can be from that point of view, you know? Yeah. So photography aside, there's other areas within that as well from an entrepreneurship and there's from the YouTube point of view. You've got some of the big names in YouTube that are teaching people how to use YouTube, how to learn the algorithms and such like that. So there's a huge repertoire of info, talent, and it's readily available. And guess what? It's free. Yeah, and, and I think it has massive potential as a marketing platform um, mm. in terms of you know having a voice and getting people interested in who you are and what you do, you know, if you, let's say that you're um, in a podcasting club and mm -hmm. people are interested in learning how to podcast and you sell a service that teaches people podcasting, boom, yeah. they see your profile, you are making sense to them, they want to learn how to do it, they sign up for your newsletter, and boom, off you are. You have customers right at your fingertips. So I think yeah. that... Um, Clubhouse is like a super untapped. I mean, I think people are figuring it out, but it's an untapped resource. Um, and I like the fact that it's more organic in nature. It's, I don't know if you've noticed this, though. There are some rooms that are recording them and releasing them as podcasts. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that you could record it because it was well, something that I was thinking of. Yeah. I'm sure some people, some someone's, you know, they figured out how to do it, like route their phones audio Through into some something to record system, it but yeah. yeah there's people recording their pipe their clubhouse and putting them on podcasts hmm. it'll be it'll be interesting to see where it goes and how it evolves i suppose over the next you know whatever period of time yeah I've heard, it stays around for a long time anyway, i've heard we'll some see. people say oh it's just a fad it's gonna go away as soon as coronavirus is over but i don't know i think it i think it has value to, i think it's here to stay yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Okay, look, um, Matt, we're going to take one very, very final quick break there and I'll be back. I've got three questions I ask every guest and just because you've had your own podcast, I'm not going to let you off. I'm going to ask you exactly the same three questions. So yeah, we'll be right back after this. If you're enjoying this episode of the Irish Photography Podcast, why not jump back and listen to the back catalog we have of episodes where you'll get some great insights from fantastic guests, gear reviews, lots of hints and tips, and above all else, keeping you company while you drive or relax. Thanks very much for listening. Please consider subscribing, leaving a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And you're very welcome back to the final part of the Irish Photography Podcast. So, Matt, like I said in part two there, I've got three questions to ask every single guest. And I'm not letting you off. I'm going to ask you all three questions as well. So the first question that I ask is, everybody has some funny story that they've encountered along the line from photography. So what's yours, Matt Payne? Well, I've got lots of funny stories, but I'm going to go with one that's a little bit fresher, um, just because it's okay. uh, more recent and... I don't know. Some people might not think this is funny, but I thought it was hysterical in a grim kind of way. And, you know, I have a dark sense okay. of humor. So. <laughs> okay. So, so last summer, uh, my friends, uh, Kane and Shane and I, um, we, we did a pretty big uh, tour of here in Colorado and then down in the desert Southwest. And we were primarily motivated about uh, drone photography. And I had just bought a drone, so I was learning. And mm -hmm. they're trying to teach me all the ins and outs of flying a drone and stuff like that. And, uh, I think it was like the third day we were out, uh, my friend Shane and I decided to hike up this really steep hillside uh, in Colorado uh, because we wanted to get up in elevation so that we could fly around this pinnacle that we were near. Okay. And so we hike up there, blah, 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 and, and we, we get our drones out. And of course, the light's getting really good and we're rushing ourselves. And he's got the, uh, the Mavic Pro 2 and I've got right. my bird in the air and it's off and it's flying. And I look over and he's trying, we're on the steep hillside, right? So like there's no flat ground. So he decides, um, and he's done this before apparently, but he decides that it would be a really good idea to launch his drone from his hand. From his yep. And of course he does it and he, we're in a rush because, you know, the light's getting good. And the, he hits, he gets it started and it like chops into his fingers like over and oh. over and over again. And of course, look over and, he, and like there's blood spurting out of his finger and it's getting all over his controller and all over his drone. <laughs> and he's just calm as can be. And he's like, he's like, oh, man, I'm bleeding. 
And you have to know Shane because he's super like zen and but he's like, oh, oh. okay. And he, he gets out like a he, he like pulls off his t shirt and he like wraps around his hand and he just keeps flying his drone. Like like nothing happened. He just flies it on, <laughs> like there's like blood flying everywhere out of his hands and he's he's fine. And I just maybe that's not funny, but I thought it was hilarious because it part of it's you have to know Shane a little bit, but uh I uh, well I, I, I find it funny because it's interesting. I launch my drone from my hand and I always do it. But when I was in the Dolomites, I forgot that I was wearing my gloves. So the extra tiny piece of my finger got caught in the propeller and all of a sudden the drone fell, whatever, five feet and the gimbal cracked off the end of the drone, right? So that was the end of my Mavic. And then I gave up on drones for a while for around two months and then the gas was too much. And I said, okay, I have to get a drone again. So I bought a Mavic Air too. And I was out in last October with a buddy of mine. He's got a boat. He wanted to get some footage for his business. And then we're all off the coast of Ireland by the old head of Kinsale. And there's big swells and such there. But of course, you're on a boat. You can't launch the drone, the, the drone from that. So I launched it from my hand, no problem. But when I was catching it, coming it back in, I was like this, trying to move my hand sure. back, you know, with the wave. And I obviously didn't time it right. <laughs> and on my right hand here, the propeller went in and it caught all the side of my little finger almost in, into the bone. Oh. And took a big chunk of skin out of my finger. So, yeah, I know exactly, exactly the pain that Shane was going through. Yeah, so, yeah, I think it's funny. I think it is grim, but, yeah, it's not something that I would recommend to anybody in any way, shape, or form. Fair play to him to continue flying. Oh, yeah, he was like, no big deal. Just going to keep going. <laughs> I mean, I was like, are you, are you okay? Like, because it looks like you might need surgery. And, I mean, he was fine. Did he? He was fine. He was totally fine. I think we, I mean, it was, oh, it was, was not, like? it was not as bad as it looked at the time, but I was like, you sure you're okay yeah. to fly still? <laughs> well, was the footage worth it? Did the footage come out? Because the light, you said the light was kicking off. So I, I think it was one was of those it. things where like, it looked like it was going to get really good. And then it was a complete dud. So it wasn't even worth <laughs> a it. A, a blood red sky. No, I would have a blood red hand instead. It's mm-hmm. all right. Thanks yep. very much. <laughs> That's right. But you know, I'll never forget that day. No, no, you won't. It's you all won't. About... And you probably will never la- you'll probably never launch your drone from your hand either never. as a result of it. Never. <laughs> Cause I'm the kind of guy that I would be clumsy enough to cut something off of me and like yeah, so no, I'm not gonna do that. Yeah, no, pass on that one, pass on that one. Okay, that's a good funny story. Good I can relate to it anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it ain't nice to feel it. Okay. Second question. You've already taught me the most of the answer, I think, in the on the very beginning. So what gear do you shoot with? Not the gear matters, but I ask every single guest, what are the camera gear that you use? So you're on Sony. Yep. So I'm currently with the Sony a7R4. Um, nice. And um, my lenses of choice are the Sigma 14 to 24, um, which nice. is it's actually pretty light for for yeah. what it is. Um, for a Sigma. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I've got the Sony 24 to 105. Nice. And then I've got the Sony 100 to 400, and then I've got the 1.4 teleconverter. Okay, so what lens do you use most often? Uh, nowadays, I probably use the 100 to 400 the most. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you mentioned that actually the last day as well, because when you take a wide open shot, people know where it is. But when you're zooming in with something with a zoom, you can't tell where it is at all. You're just picking out a vignette of the scene in the bigger landscape. Yeah, it's um, a lot of it's fun. It's something that, yeah, it is fun. It is fun. What, and what do you sit it on? What tripod do you use? So I am a Photo Pro ambassador. So I have a Photo Pro. Um, I don't even know the numbers on it, uh, but it's super nice. It's a carbon fiber. Uh, nice. It's a Global Elite um, Photo Pro tripod, and I like it because it is super sturdy. Um, I've taken it through its paces. I mean, it's not the lightest tripod, um, mm-hmm. but it's very, very sturdy and has held up to a lot of abuse. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very nice. Tripods are important. And the final question on gear, what bag do you put it all in? Yeah, so I'm lucky enough, um, a couple of years ago, I did a, uh, I did a uh, environmental award through my podcast. So I awarded a photographer. I actually had people nominate a photographer who was having an, an environmental impact through their photography. And I was able to get Shimoda to sponsor uh, the nice. award and they were um, kind enough to send me a Shimoda um, Action X50 and nice. I liked it so much that I bought the Action X70 as well it's um, it's really comfortable it's 
really well thought through in terms of where to put your equipment. I do a lot mm -hmm. of backpacking and I'm able to fit all my stuff into the X50 for like a three to four day trip or the X70 for like a five or six day trip. So, yeah. And that has the roll down top as well, isn't it? It does. Yeah. And it's yeah. pretty much waterproof. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Good. A bag is very important, as you say, and also that it fits comfortably down your back. Because if you're going and traveling and you've got a lot of weight, not only from the camera gear, but also food, you know, when you're first starting off and you're going for a few days, you're bringing a lot of weight as your food. I mean, yep. and you have to have space to be able to put that in. So, yeah, bag is really, really important. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Good. Good. Okay, final question. So it's a regular statement, a regular staple of the podcast. It's VSP. It stands for Very Solid Product. And it's a product that you won't leave home without. You put your name to it if you could. So what's your VSP? All right. Well, this one's kind of a little bit, um, it's a little bit different than what other people might respond with, but, uh, I'm going to go with a solar generator and it's the, uh, Blue Eddy EB240. Okay. So it's a, it packs a lot of punch. It's got 2,400 watt hours of storage and it has a thousand watt inverter on it. So if you do a lot of drone photography and you're out in the middle of nowhere, um, you know that you need something to charge your drone batteries with day in, day out. And so mm -hmm. having a big uh, battery full of energy to be able to then charge batteries with or charge your camera batteries or 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 whatever, it's really nice to have that. And I can't foresee a trip where I would actually run out of power. It's got a lot of stored nice. energy in it. So and it, it, Does it roll up into a kind of... Um... Like a pouch, like as if it's a bag itself, rolls into itself, is it? No, it's actually huge, man. I mean, not huge, oh. but it's um, it's probably the size of a suitcase. Wow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Only thicker, a thick suitcase. Yeah. And you carry that with you when you're going on hikes? Not on hikes. Um, okay, this is the one that's, that you have on the truck. Yeah, it's in the car. And, um, you know, it's great for recharging drone batteries. Uh, um, okay, I know what the one. Yeah, so you and you you got an, uh, a custom adapter at the front of it as well, so that you can put it onto the hood of the car, and then you got your connectors at the back, so you can charge everything in the back. Yeah. Um. So that's for my car battery. So that's a whole different system. Oh, that's a whole. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it does have a it does have a input for solar, so you can recharge it via solar energy as well. Um, Unreal. Yeah. Class. Class, yeah. I mean, look, there's nothing worse than if you're going out on a hike and you run out of power. I mean, you, you know, now you, mind you, you're on an A7 R4, so you're okay. If you were on an A7 R2, you'd need batteries recharged every five minutes. So yeah, I used to. Um, you don't have that problem. I still carry it with me, but I used to bring like a twenty thousand milliamp or, I guess, mini amp hour, um, yeah, anchor battery, uh, so that I could keep my camera and my phone charged. Because I do a lot of. For my phone, you know, I'm using Gaia GPS for a lot of my navigation, so I need to keep my phone charged too when I'm doing backpacking. Mm -hmm. So I would say mm -hmm. my phone is probably the second thing I wouldn't leave home without. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I think everybody has that in their pocket anyway. So, you know, you're, there's nothing unique about that one, Matt. You can't take that one as a VSP, right? Because that's just standard run of the mill. Like, so I think, you know, the solar, absolutely, and a great idea. It's well, different. Which is vital. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. 100%. So, Matt, we're almost there, I suppose. You know, I just want to ask you a couple of other questions. Like, have you have you visited Ireland before? Yeah, I have. Um, it was before I was into photography, although I did have that Sony DSC eight two eight, and I do have some okay photos from that trip, which are not good, but it was still still <laughs> cool to look at them. Um, but I was there for two weeks back in two thousand five, um, and uh, we started out in Dublin, and then we did a trip out to Galway. And then we went to the um, Aran Islands for a few days. Very nice. Did Very some nice. bicycling around the islands, and that that place is amazing. Um, yeah, I would encourage. We're, we're spoiled. It's a really we're cool spoiled. spot. Yeah, we're um, spoiled. And then I went to and, Doolin, and okay, you know, and got shit faced. Drank a ton of ton of Guinness. Yes. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to do that if you're going to Doolin. It's not allowed to go to Doolin and not leave there. Absolutely. Shit well, I'm a big fan of. Uh, traditional celtic music so it was awesome oh, it's, aw it's awesome seeing you know, seeing it play live in a pub with you know yeah. it's so cool 
We don't have pubs in Ireland anymore. They've been banned. They're gone. They've been extradited. Since March of last year, there's been no pubs open in Ireland, except if you're serving food, and that was only for four months out of the last 12. Uh, so for a country that has, you know, socialising and music and the pub atmosphere and everything is so ingrained in its culture, it's just been a culture shock for the last year. But hopefully it'll return soon. You'll get back. Yeah, we will. We will. And you know what? I mean, you know, if you ever find that you're able to travel around the place again, you know, come back to Ireland now with the camera and you'll see a whole different world, I oh imagine. My because, gosh. you know, as you know, I mean, when your eyes change from an ordinary layperson's eyes to a photographer's eyes, you see things completely different. Oh, 100%. And yeah, you know, yeah, you'll be welcome in Ireland anytime in any AMS. Don't you worry. Um, so, yeah, speaking of, you know, next steps and outside of things when things start changing. What's next for you? What's on the cards for you this year in 2021? Yeah, so 2021, I'm really focused on growing my business um, and my podcast and the photography competition and Mm. um, trying to put some things into motion to eventually break out and be able to do photography full time. So that's been, um, I've been focused a lot on marketing and all that fun stuff. So that's, that's my goal. Yeah. Brilliant. I look forward to following the journey along anyway. And, you know, from speaking of following the journey along, where can people find more information on you? Yeah. So a um, good place to start is my website, mattpainphotography.com. You know, and obviously I'm on all the the socials, uh, you know, Instagram, Matt Payne Photo, Twitter, Matt Payne Photo, Facebook, Matt Payne Photography. You know, mm-hmm. got to love the dead reach on Facebook, but um um and then i do have a youtube channel that occasionally i'll throw some stuff into i i had a lofty goal of doing it for a weekly release and i just got super overwhelmed over the summer and couldn't pull it off but uh hats off to those of you that have figured out how to do that good god it's hard work it is hard work but you know what it's fun it's fun. It, it kind of brings it to another level as well um, from a photography point of view because you're telling a story through moving image as opposed to just the image. And that's where I enjoy it even more so. But I've, yeah, it, it ain't easy. It ain't I've easy probably got sure. a, a year's worth of footage. I just haven't edited it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? That's another sideline project there you could do and you could kind of, you know, dovetail it with something else. Dovetail it with something else. Matt, I've really, really enjoyed the conversation this evening. Thank you very, very much for coming on and sharing your photography uh, story. Like I said, you know, you're more than welcome anytime that you ever come to Ireland and we'll give you, it's an Irish word for 100,000 welcomes. It's Cade Mila Falcha. And, you know, you'll be getting a lot of those, I'm sure. Maybe 100,000 Guinnesses might work as well, but we'll see. <laughs> it depends on the time when you can get over. But, yeah, I really, really enjoyed the uh, conversation, Matt. Thank you very much for uh, joining. And hopefully I'll see you at some stage again. But from me in Ireland to you in the beautiful Colorado, Schlange Fall. Cheers and thank you. Hey, guys, if you dig what you're hearing, why don't you jump over to iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating and don't forget to share with your friends. With all that done, we'll see you next week. And remember, keep shooting.